Oke, selamat datang. Oza, silakan di admit semua yang di waiting room. Oke, teman-teman semuanya, selamat datang di kursus Ramadan Yatmi Kurma nomor 3 setelah pertama kita adakan uh, kursus fracturing oleh Aryan Dumakmun dan kemudian uh, tips and tricks interview oleh Mas Hudi hari ini uh, kita menyajikan call tubing fundamental yang akan diberikan oleh expert-expert di industri uh, well service call tubing which is Muhammad Arifin, John Rizal Jenny, dan Dani Aryo Wijoseno. Perkenalkan nama saya Yando, saya adalah Sekjen Kopum Yadmi 2019-2022. Sebelum kita memulai, kita akan dengarkan dulu kata sambutan dari uh, Pak John Hisa Simamora, Ketua Yadmi, dan kemudian oleh Pak Hadi Ismoyo, Sekjen Yadmi. Silakan Oza. Teman-teman Yatmi yang saya sayangi, saya John Hisar Simamora, Ketua Yatmi 2019-2022. Sebelum saya memulai sambutan, saya mengucapkan selamat menjalankan ibadah puasa bagi teman-teman muslim. Semoga diberi kesehatan, kekuatan, dan amal ibadahnya diterima. Amin. Selanjutnya saya mengucapkan selamat datang kepada lebih dari seribu mahasiswa dan dosen seluruh ilmu Yatmi dengan instruktur terbaik dan merupakan leader di industri perminyakan. Di kursus ini juga kami memberikan sertifikat yang kami harapkan akan berguna untuk adik-adik mahasiswa sebagai penguat CV pada saat nanti memasuki dunia kerja. Sebelum menutup sambutan di masa pandemik seperti saat ini, saya mengingatkan kembali semua anggota IADMI, adik-adik mahasiswa, dan para dosen yang terhormat untuk tetap menjaga kesehatan. Patuhi PSBB jika berlaku di daerah kalian dan lakukan hal-hal penting seperti mencuci tangan, memakai masker, hindari keluar rumah jika tidak perlu, istirahat dan olahraga yang cukup, serta menunda mulik. Terima kasih saya sampaikan kepada instruktur yang akan mengisi acara secara training ini. Juga kepada Mas Yando yang mengorganis kampanye ini, tim sekretariat, Kopum Yatmi, dan segenap panitia, Mas Samsul, Mas Hadi, Mas Dini. Jangan lupa follow Instagram dan Telegram Big Yatmi. Selamat menikmati kurus ini dan semoga ilmu ini berguna bagi kita semua. Terima kasih. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh Selamat datang mahasiswa dan dosen Perminyakan dan Kiwisaya Indonesia Saya Hati Ismoyo, Sekjen Yadmi Pusat Senang sekali melihat antusiasme Dari rekan-rekan sekalian dalam training World Tubing Yang saat ini dihadiri oleh seribu orang World Tubing ini merupakan salah satu pilar Lima pilar peningkatan produksi migas nasional Yaitu ekorasi, rewar, well program Service Optimization dan BOD Exploration Nama training ini kita sebut sebagai kurma kursus Ramadan yang bersertifikat semoga bisa menjadi pendamping ilmu bagi rekan-rekan sekalian dalam memasuki era industri di oil and gas dan coal tubing itu merupakan salah satu unit besar dalam welco program yang bisa menggantikan rig cepat dan efisien seperti yang telah kami lakukan di blok cepu dengan program gas shut off kami menggunakan Beruntung kita mempunyai expert yang sangat mumpuni, World Tubing Unit SLB yang terdiri dari Mas Arifin, Mas John, Mas Dani. Terima kasih atas waktu yang telah diberikan kepada kami dalam sharing session ini. Mudah-mudahan bisa berjalan dengan lancar dan hatur nuhun kepada Mas Yando dan tim yang telah mempersiapkan segala sesuatunya sampai pada persiapan training pagi ini. Selamat belajar dan jangan lupa. Follow Instagram Yati Pusat, YouTube Yatmi Training. Oke, kita lanjutkan dengan sambutan dari Mas Samsul, Ketua Kopum Yatmi. Mas Samsul, silakan Mas.
Kalau Mas Samsul. Oza. Bisa di-unmute nggak Mas Samsul mungkin? Oke. Okay. While waiting for Mas Samsul, nanti Mas Samsul kalau masuk silakan langsung uh, sela saja saya. Uh, kembali saya uh, selamat datang kepada para presenter. Bapak Muhammad Arifin dari Islam Beje. Dan Bapak John uh, dari Islam Beje juga. Dan Bapak Dani, terima kasih atas waktu yang diberikan untuk IATMI untuk menyada, uh, mengadakan presentasi ini. Uh, saya akan persilakan nanti masing-masing presenter untuk membacakan CV-nya masing-masing ya, uh, supaya lebih abdol. Untuk adik-adik semua yang baru join, saya akan bacakan aturan main selama presentasi ini. Bertanya di Zoom, kalian boleh bertanya, bertanya langsung di Zoom dengan suara memakai fitur raise hand. Jadi kalau mau bertanya raise hand dulu, nanti ada Mas Oza yang akan memperhatikan raise hand kalian. Kemudian bertanya juga bisa dilakukan di Zoom. Di Zoom chatting, fasilitas chatting kalian boleh bertanya. Dan nanti Mas Arifin, Mas John atau Mas Dani yang sedang tidak presentasi bisa menjawab pertanyaan kalian di Zoom. Uh, saya notes nanti uh, Mas Arifin, Mas John, dan Mas Dani pada saat menjawab di live chat di Zoom, sila tolong atau di YouTube, tolong balas dengan huruf besar. Jadi huruf besar ini bukan marah ya, tapi menandakan bahwa itu adalah jawaban. Kemudian di YouTube kita ada Mbak Dia. Mbak Dia ini adalah salah satu technical expert selam BJ juga di Jakarta yang juga akan menjawab pertanyaan-pertanyaan kalian di live chatnya YouTube. Jadi silakan yang mau bertanya di Zoom atau bertanya di YouTube, silakan ya. Saat ini kita sudah 334 orang di Zoom, uh, bertambah terus. Dan di YouTube, coba saya lihat saat ini ada sekitar YouTube. Di YouTube ada sekitar 54. ya Oke. Okay. Di Telegram juga sudah rame yang mulai uh, absen, jadi saya akan persilahkan uh, sesudah ini teman-teman adik-adik silahkan absen di Telegram formatnya sudah saya berikan ya kan di Telegram silahkan absen di sana uh, again uh, selamat datang dan Mas Arifin uh, silahkan dimulai Mas oh bentar Mas Samsul sudah ada belum Mas? Oke, Mas Samsulnya belum ada ya. Silakan aja, Mas Arifin, dimulai presentasinya. Terima kasih, adik-adik. Silakan selamat menikmati. Oke, uh, terima kasih, Mas Yando, atas waktunya. Um, so, I was told that we're going to do this presentation in English, but uh, is it still on, Mas Yando, or are we going to do it in Indonesia? No, we will do it in English. Go ahead, Pak. Oke. Okay. All right, I will uh, start sharing my screen and then I will start my presentation, okay? Let me know if you can see that. We see it clearly, thank you. Yep, all right. So again, thank you, Mas Yando, and thank you for IATMI who uh, invited us to give this uh, basic uh, training about the cold tubing uh, surface. Um, so the... Uh, Once we get the invitation, we get together and then we um, have three people committed to do, uh, do this uh, presentation. And uh, I'm based in Jakarta. Uh, Bang John is based in uh, Saudi and Danny is based in uh, Malaysia. So the uh, outline of this presentation is, uh, we, I'll start with a little bit about the presenter and then the introduction about the cold tubing services, uh, the application, right? and how we are using cold tubing surface around the globe, right? And then uh, we are going to uh, highlight three applications, spatial application using cold tubing, right? And then after that, we will have a discussion and we'll uh, close this um, online uh, presentation with a quizzes, right? All right, so a little bit about myself. I have uh, about uh, more than 20 years of experience in oil field, right? I started off in uh, Duri 
and uh, work uh, about five years across Indonesia in Jakarta in Balikpapan and then I moved to Yaman right and then after that I work in Algeria um, spend uh, several years in uh, headquarter in Sugarland then moved to Saudi before I came back to Indonesia in early 2019 so I have been uh, instructor for couple of uh, next training, also uh, YADMI trainings, right? I wrote about 10 uh, technical paper and I also co-author for uh, all the cold tubing training manual for Slumberjay. Uh, next one will, um, uh, Danny. Oh, no, I think uh, next one is mine. Oh, okay, sorry, sorry, yeah, sorry. Yeah, my name is John John Jenny. I graduated from Trisakti uh, Mechanical Engineering in 1997. Right away, joined uh, Schlumberger in Dury, 97, for about two and a half years, then moved to Alaska for two years, uh, come back to Jakarta for another four, then moved to Sugarland for another four years there, uh, Houston, Sugarland, then moved to... Um, Kuala Lumpur for six years, come back to Jakarta and uh, currently in Saudi Arabia. I've been in the, in the company for 20, about 23 years. I've been uh, involved in various cold tubing and uh, anything called, related to cold tubing applications from all over the, the, the world. Uh, been an instructor as well for Next and um, currently uh, holding principle for uh, Kingdom of Saudi Arabia. And also, uh, right now, I'm covering uh, as the subject matter expert for culture being drilling. Thank you. Okay, next one is um, for Danny. Go ahead, Danny. Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, thank you for uh, the time. So my name is Dani Arwiyoseno. Uh, I'm graduate from University of Indonesia, Metallurgy Materials in 2005. And uh, after that, I do several works outside oil and gas. But in 2007, I'm starting in Slumberjay straight away. So at the beginning of my career, I'm working in, uh, in Malikpapan. So basically, uh, over there, I'm handling as a technical for several clients, right? And then uh, by 2012, I moved to uh, Malaysia. Over there, I'm starting handling uh, the biggest client over there, which is uh, Petronas. And uh, fast forward, uh, uh, I, be uh, I become the technical expert for uh, cold tubing for Southeast Asia. So at, uh, during that time, on that period, I also become several instructor uh, in uh, Caliville and also Abu Dhabi on 2013. And uh, up to now, uh, I also write several technical papers. Uh, right now, it's already until 13, I believe, uh, and then still more to come. And uh, I hope uh, you will enjoy the presentation. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you, Padani. All right, so why cold tubing, right? So cold tubing, you can think of it as a small rig, right? And as uh, John and uh, Pahadi mentioned, right? It is an important uh, service in the oil field, right? In fact, uh, when you look at this uh, slide, right? You can see the worldwide uh, cold tubing unit counts from uh, uh, 2000 until 2016, right? As you can see, it is growing, right? Uh, every year we are putting more uh, unit uh, into the surfaces, right? Even when you, uh, we have a um, slowdown in 2014, right? The number of unit is not going down significantly. It's still uh, staying uh, quite flat, right? So at the table below, you'll see the uh, distribution of the cold tubing unit from different regions. And here is just a screenshot how many units we have in Indonesia. 
among other countries, right? I put the yellow highlight in Indonesia, right? This is the data from 2016. It might be slightly changed up to now, right? So on the left side, you see the major player for cold tubing uh, services, right? And this slide, it gives you the highlight, right? Uh, on the top side, this is the, um, the global oil field service uh, with regard to the revenue, right? And as you can see in 2014, there is like a big drops in the revenue, right? Until 2016, before it start to increase again, right? Uh, on the right side, you see the annual changes as the percentage of changes, right? In 2015 and 2016, as uh, you would uh, expect, there is like a negative uh, growth with regard to the uh, services, right? On the lower side, you can uh, see that this is specifically for cold tubing services. Although the trend look type, kind of similar, but uh, you can see that from 2016, when the activity increased, right? You can see that the cold tubing activity increased um, uh, exceeding the uh, increase in the oil field. It means that the industry see the benefit of using the cold tubing to revamp the uh, production and also, it is considered to be one way to uh, make the operation more efficient in terms of the cost, right? So for those who are still um, new um, with the uh, cold tubing, right? Basically, like I mentioned earlier, right? It is like a small rig, right? Uh, however, the difference with rig is that it allows you to um, perform live well intervention. What does it mean with the live well intervention? It means that you can intervene or you can go inside the well with the well having the pressure um, on it, right? Uh, this is not something that uh, many intervention can do, right? For example, uh, a certain uh, well intervention technique uh, needs to kill the well, right? With the cold tubing, you don't need to because it is designed and equipped with the equipment to allow you to do the live well intervention, right? Uh, the next one, uh, it also allows you to do the intervention in the horizontal or multilateral wells, right? So this is not uh, the case for, for example, with slick line or Y line or any intervention that relies on the gravity to reach the target depth. With a cold tubing, you can uh, intervene to the target depth, even though um, it is in a multilateral section or it is in the deep horizontal section, right? Because the, the pipe from the cold tubing, it is uh, more rigid that allows you to go deeper, right? So the next one is that uh, it allows you to do the rigless intervention, whether it is drilling, milling, or fishing operation. Uh, and uh, when you look at the industry, right, in the oil field, there are a lot of ship from completing the well with the rig to completing the well without the rig, right? You see like a, a lot of um, efficiency being made by doing the job without the rig, right? And the rig can uh, do um, more drilling operation or they can, uh, what do you call it, uh, do another type of work. So um, uh, using the cold tubing, you can also do the well completion, including the artificial lead, right? I mean, the technology is developing, right? So what uh, once was thought to be impossible, right? With the advancement of the technique and the technology, it is now possible to do all those with the cold tubing, right? And at the end of the day, uh, the final uh, object, uh, the final, um, of, uh, what do you call it, uh, target is to lower the uh, overall cost, right? Because there's no point to use the cold tubing if at the end of the day, it makes the whole job more expensive. Right, so this is just a couple of uh, pictures, right? From uh, cold tubing drilling operation in Alaska, right? So um, for in the past, right, when people think about uh, drilling the well, they're thinking about using the drilling rig, right? But uh, now we have uh, a lot of location where we are doing uh, cold tubing drilling. Uh, Pak John will uh, give more details 
when he will talk about a special application uh, of cold tubing drilling, right? Okay, so uh, cold tubing, right? This is a basic package of cold tubing, right? On the top, you have the control unit. Uh, FYI, this is not the standard control unit, right? I mean, I'm just taking a picture of one of the nicest ones, right? Uh, but uh, for conventional unit, it may be different uh, slightly, right? But the basic configuration of the cold tubing unit, you have the power pack, right? So what is power pack? Power pack is basically an engine with a lot of hydraulic pumps, right? So the hydraulic pumps will provide power to different uh, part of the cold tubing, right? Uh, the reason we use a hydraulic um, power to operate different uh, part of uh, cold tubing unit is because uh, when uh, the cold tubing unit was first invented, it was considered to be one of the most efficient way to operate or to uh, provide the power for different part of the cold tubing. We are going to talk about different part of cold tubing later. Right? So the next one is the control uh, cabin, right? The control cabin is where the operator will operate all different part of the cold tubing, right? So from one single uh, location, the job supervisor or the cold tubing operator will be able to operate the reel, the injector head, the BOP, and everything, right? So this is, you can consider it as the heart of the cold tubing unit, right? Another part of the cold tubing uh, unit is called the reel, right? The reel is basically just a big drums where it is um, used to spool or to store cold tubing pipe, right? So the beauty of cold tubing unit is that it has non-jointed pipe, right? It's, uh, the pipe is continuous, right? So all this continuous pipe is stored inside the reel. You can uh, probably take the similar analogy like, uh, you know, like uh, communication cables, right? Or the power cable, right? Uh, you may wonder how come you can uh, spool or you can um, uh, keep this uh, pipe onto the rail, right? Well, the cold tubing pipe has a specific uh, properties that it will not break when you uh, spool it onto the rail, right? Of course, it has to meet a several condition. For example, the rail has to be big enough with regard to the cold tubing OD uh, normally the core ID, the core diameter of the reel has to be 40%, sorry, 40 times from the OD of the coil tubing, right? And this is the injector head, right? So the injector head is basically uh, the piece of the equipment that will run the coil tubing pipe inside the well, right? So when the well has a pressure, right? So there will be a resistance for the pipe to enter the well. The injector head will kind of push the pipe so it can enter the well, right? But as the pipe getting longer inside the well, the pipe will be getting heavier, right? So the injector head will also um, maintain the weight or you know hang the weight of the cold tubing pipe so it will not drag the remaining of the pipe down to the well, right? So it allows a controllable movement of the cold tubing pipe inside and outside. The next one is a BOP. BOP stands for uh, blowout preventers, right? So as the name implies, right, it, it is an equipment that will allow well control operation when needed, right? For cold tubing uh, BOP, it has the blind ramps, which will seal the um, the well bore when needed, right? It has a CRM that will cut the cold tubing pipe in case of the emergency. It has the slip rams where it will hold the weight of the cold tubing pipe when it is required. And then it has the, uh, sorry, the slip rams that will uh, hold the weight of the cold tubing pipe. And then it has the pipe rams that will seal the annular area between the cold tubing and the well bores, right? So that allows the pressure in the well is isolated in case you need to open something above the BOP. And then you have the crane uh, as a way to 
lift the injector head. But in a certain uh, situation, you don't have the crane. It may be replaced with the jacking frame or coil tubing tower. But normally, uh, the, the crane will be part of the coil tubing, whether it is going to be used uh, temporarily just to lift or it's going to be used permanently to hold the weight of the uh, injector head during the whole operation. So uh, there are various types of cold tubing units, right? Basically, you can fit the cold tubing unit based on the need, right? This is the picture of the cold tubing that is mounted on the trailer. The reason we mount it on the trailer is uh, for fast mobilization, right? Uh, it can be uh, fit in uh, one or two trailer. If the cold tubing pipe is quite huge, like you see in this picture, uh, normally the whole package can be adapted in two trailers, right? The next picture is a more uh, compact uh, trailer mounted or truck mounted cold tubing, right? As you can see that the whole package, the power pack, the control cabin, the reel, the injector head, the BOP, they are all in one single uh, uh, truck, right? And this is something that we normally use for location like Dury where the well are very shallow, right? And the pressure is not that high, right? So uh, it allows like a fast mobilization I remember days uh, when I was in Dury, right? Uh, in one day, we were able to do like a three wells in one day, right? As in um, Saudi, because of different environment, right? Uh, Sometimes one well can take about two weeks, right, to complete. But it depends on uh, the type of operation and the well condition as well. Uh, this is a mass unit, very nice, right? As you can see that the injector head doesn't have the crane, right? It has a mass like uh, supporting beams, right? That uh, is uh, equipped with the hydraulic units, right? So having the hydraulic unit equipped in the mass, it will allow you to move the, uh, the injector head up and down without uh, needing the crane. So what you need to do, uh, for example, the picture on the right, the unit called Coach Being Express, right? So during the transportation, the mass will um, be tilted down all the way to the uh, to the to the trucks, right? So it can move down, right? So the injector head will uh, fall down as well, right? And then you go to the well, you uh, spot the uh, truck close to the well head, and then after that you raise the mass, right, to the position where the cold tubing is aligned with the well head, and then you connect the injector head to the well head, and uh, there you go. You can start doing the operation. Uh, this is the setup for the skip or the barge mounted normally for the offshore operation because uh, frequent transportation from one place to another, right? Especially for the offshore, the unit will have a skip. A skip is basically like a protecting uh, metal around the unit uh, in case during the transportation or lifting it hit on something, it's not going to uh, damage the, the units, right? And this is one of the latest invention in the cold tubing, right? I mentioned in the beginning that um, most cold tubing units are run by hydraulic uh, powers, right? You have an engine and then you have a lot of pumps and then the engine will move the pumps and then the pump will pressurize a hydraulic um, uh, fluid and the hydraulic fluid is transferred to the hose and then it will uh, operate different part of a coil tubing, the motors, the reel, the pipe, injector head, and everything, right? But this unit is run by electric powers, right? As you can see that uh, this unit is big, right? Uh, we, Slumber J uh, has this type of uh, unit in uh, several locations um, in the uh, US and in uh, Saudi for coil tubing drilling, right? This use electric uh, powers, right? You have like um, um, a huge genset that will provide the electric powers and then you don't have the hydraulic um, hose, but you have the electric cables to run the units, right? So this uh, slide gives you like a different type of the uh, intervention. You have the slick line, you have the E line, and then uh, normally when uh, it is on horizontal wells, right, where the E-line cannot go deeper because of limited um, gravity pull, right, 
they can go with the tractors, right? And then uh, you have crawl tubing uh, that will allow you not only to intervene, but also to convey fluid, right? And then you have a different type of uh, pipe intervention, for example, like a hydraulic work over unit or even like a work over rigs, right? Uh, different type of intervention has uh, their own advantage. For example, slick line and uh, wire line, normally they are very fast in mobilization because their unit is not as big as uh, either crawl tubing or hydraulic work over unit or drilling rig. Right? So as for the uh, application for the crawl tubing, the majority of the application are still for well bore clean out and well circulation, right? Because this is something that um, cannot be done by slick line or Y line. They cannot circulate uh, fluid to clean out the well or to circulate some things, right? And at the same time, although it can be done by hydraulic work over unit or drilling rig, but it's going to be uh, more difficult with regard to mobilization, rigging up, and also the time to complete the operations, right? So, uh, yep, uh, the majority of the application is for well work cleanup and circulation. Uh, we also uh, have a major, uh, what you call a big application for. Uh, well, uh, well stimulation, right, with the acid, right, and also tool contents. We we'll talk about it later in details. Okay, for the cold tubing application, we can uh, group them into three uh, big uh, um, groups, right. The first one is the uh, fluid conveyance, meaning that we pump a fluid from surface to downhole, right with the intention to achieve something, right? For example, here you have the nitrogen kickoff. Basically, you circulate uh, nitrogen through the coil down to the well, right? To uh, when the gas, when the nitrogen gas is circulated, because of the lighter density, it will start coming up uh, to surface in the annulus, right? While it comes up to the surface, it will in train or it will bring some of the liquid from the well bores, right? And at the end of the day, the uh, liquid in the well bore will be removed from the well. Why we do that? When we remove the liquid from the well, right? It will re uh, reduce the hydrostatic inside the well bore that the reservoir pressure will start to be higher than the hydrostatic and then the well will flow by itself. Uh, the next one, the next big one is the fill removal, right? Fill removal is basically circulating a liquid inside the well bore, and then this liquid moving up from downhole to surface will carry some of the uh, sand or fields or debris from the well. By doing this, we will be able to clean the well from debris or the sand or fields, right? Uh, cement placement is also the next one, right? Basically, when you want to put a cement plug down into the well, right, to isolate a certain zone, you can easily do that by using cold tubing. Matrix acidizing basically is the same. However, the only difference is that uh, we are not circulating the fluid, but we are injecting the treatment fluid to the formation. And then we can also do the hydraulic fracturing, right? Uh, it has a different design, but the concept is the same. We circulate or we squeeze a treatment fluid through the coil tubing to the target zones. For the coil tubing tool conveyance, right? Uh, coil tubing can also be used for logging, right? Normally logging is done by Y-line, right? However, in a situation where Y-line cannot go to target depth, for example, because of the horizontal wells, right? Uh, we can go with a cold tubing, right? Milling and drilling, right? Basically, it can be done, right? Again, uh, we'll talk about that later in cold tubing drilling as a special application, right? Fishing operation is something that we can also do with a cold tubing. Basically, we attach a fishing tool at the end of the cold tubing pipe, right? And then we go to target depth and then we fish the object that we want to retrieve to surface, right? Perforating is the same. Basically, we, uh, we attach um, a gun with a special firing head that we can uh, control for the detonation, right? So we don't have like an unintentional detonation, not at the target depth, right? Uh, there are a lot of different techniques of doing that, but the most important thing is to ensure that we are at depth, right? So 
that's why for the cold tubing preparation, it is very important to have an accurate depth measurement at in real time. Scale removal, right? Uh, we talk about well bore clean out. Basically, it has the same uh, technique, right? However, we may need a special um, tool to remove a hard scale, right? It can be like a jetting tool, it can be like a milling tool to remove the scales, right? And the next one is about the journal isolation, right? We can go with a special tool to um, straddle. When, when I said straddle, basically to isolate the lower side and the upper side across a target zone so that whatever we do is going to go uh, accurately to the target zones, right? So we will be able to identify the zone and then we isolate the zone and then we uh, we treat that zone with a spatial technique or a spatial fluid. Cold tubing completion, right? Uh, we can uh, take the uh, example of casing patch. Basically, when there is like a well integrity issue in the well bore, right? Like a, a hole or a corrosion, you can run a spatial patch, a spatial metal that can be expanded, and then we go to target depth and then we set it there and then it will be compressed to be part of the wellbore completion, right? Um, uh, I'm, not, I'm going to talk about the velocity string. Basically, it's just to uh, complete the well with a smaller uh, cold tubing pipe, right? Uh, the objective is that when the um, ID is getting smaller, the velocity will be higher that it will induce the production, especially in a low bottom hole pressure well or well, gas well that has some uh, problem with the water hold up, right? Uh, electric submersible pumps, right? Uh, basically, this is to install down hole pump to produce uh, the well, right? Uh, but uh, the special thing about this thing is that the cold tubing is equipped with a power cable so that when the downhole pump is set on target depth, right, the power can be transmitted through the power cable that is um, inside the cold tubing. There are different techniques uh, for this uh, ESP, but uh, the, I mean, this is just a basic understanding how to set the uh, downhole pump with the cold tubing. Okay. So now we're going through uh, a quick overview of the worldwide cold tubing application. So this is just basically the highlight by uh, no means. This is uh, to show that this is the only application. Uh, as I showed you earlier in the um, previous slide, so many applications we can do with the cold tubing, but uh, these are just the highlight, okay? Okay, the first one uh, I want to mention, of course, Indonesia, right? The most common cold tubing size for application is in Indonesia is uh, one and a half to two inch, right? But it doesn't mean that we don't have a bigger cold tubing uh, application. Uh, normally, a uh, special application calls for a bigger one. For example, in geothermals, right? They can uh, use the benefit of using two and three eight inch coil or even two seven eight inch coil, right? Uh, the majority of the environment in Indonesia is uh, land operation. We're talking about uh, places like Java, right? Uh, Pertamina in Java or uh, in uh, uh, Sumatra, right? Swam in Balikpapan, right? Offshore uh, between uh, Kalimantan and um, Sulawesi, right? Uh, and geothermal. Uh, Indonesia is um, the country with the biggest um, potential for uh, geothermal. So the challenges, right? The geographical spread, right? Of course, because uh, we have uh, 17,000 islands, right? To move one cold tubing unit from one place to another uh, pose a challenge by itself, right? You, we have also some uh, production problems in uh, Balikpapan area, in Kalimantan area, right? Most of our our well is low bottom hole pressure, right? Uh, most well are very old, right? And we also have like a heavy oil uh, problems uh, in Sumatra, right? Most common application, well clean out, kick off, and stimulation. Uh, some of the highlight application in Indonesia is hand control, water and gas shut off, basically to shut off the zone where it start producing gas or water stream. 
In Australia, uh, most common cold tubing unit is uh, from two inch to two and seven eight, right? The environment is land and offshore. The challenge is uh, high rate stimulation and deep waters, right? Uh, the highlight application is cold tubing fracturing. As I mentioned earlier, right, uh, we can actually do fracturing using the cold tubing. The benefit is that uh, when you have a long interval with several uh, zones to frag, right, using a cold tubing fracturing, you can pinpoint the zone where you want to frag, right, and then you can uh, focus on that one, and then after that, you move on to uh, one and the next one, right. In China, the uh, most common uh, size is between uh, what do you call, one and a half to, uh, oh, sorry. Uh, sorry, this is, I need to move this one a little bit. Okay, uh, from one and a half to two inch coil, right? The environment is land offshore. Uh, similar to Indonesia, the geographical spread in China is amazing, right? It's quite big, right? Uh, most common application, well clean out and stimulation. Uh, highlight application is uh, we normally do logging with temperature measurement with a special cold tubing pipe that is equipped with the fiber, right? So the fiber that we normally use for internet um, communication, right, can also be installed inside the cold tubing to allow you to transmit the data so you can get like a real-time downhole information or at the same time, it gives you like a temperature measurement along the well bore right? In Japan, uh, not so many cold tubing operation. Normally, uh, the activity activity is uh, driven by a special project, right? Normally, uh, the uh, operation is in land, right? The challenge is uh, high temperature. We're talking about temperature between 300 degree Fahrenheit to 450 degree Fahrenheit, which is very hot for uh, comparing to many other location, right? The most common application is stimulation and water shut off. And the highlight is uh, for long interval preparation. We can talk about it later. Uh, the next slide, I will hand it over to Danny uh, to give the description for application in uh, Southeast Asia. Go ahead, Pak Danny. Uh, wait, uh, sorry, Pak Arifin. Maybe we uh, let student, if anybody wants to ask a question. Uh, from your presentation before we move on to uh, Danny. Oh, okay. Go ahead. No problem. Yes. So, uh, Adik Adik, go ahead. If you have any question, you can ask in Indonesia, you can ask in English. Raise your hand and then uh, uh, Oza will uh, get you. Okay. Anybody? And, uh, yeah. And remember, there is a prize for people who answer the question and who ask the what do you call it, the, the best uh, question as well right? you decide paripin yeah okay afif uh okay there are three participants raise hand now oza can you just admit the admit them please sudah pak okay. afif silakan all right okay, selamat siang siang mas sariano mas sarif mas dani mas yeah. din mas john uh, pakai bahasa indonesia aja mas ya go ahead <laughs> langsung aja jadi kalau yang saya tanyakan itu tentang aplikasinya tadi kan banyak banget itu aplikasinya apakah satu-satu sesuai kebutuhan atau bisa langsung digunakan beberapa gitu dari penggunaannya gitu sekali masukin langsung pakai semuanya gitu oke okay. uh, ada pertanyaan lain atau bisa saya langsung jawab uh, jawab aja Terima dulu kasih, Pak Arifin oke okay. alright so I will stick with English oke okay? oke okay, thank you yes. for that question so ya yeah, um, Normally, it, de it depends on the type of application. Several applications can be run uh, continuously, right? For example, when we want to do well clean out stimulation, nitrogen kickoff, right? You can do uh, all those without even pulling the coal tubing back to surface, right? However, for different applications, it requires a certain bottom hole assembly, right? For example, when uh, we want to do like um, um, coil frag, right? We, we need to have like a special um, packer, right? That will isolate the bottom and the top side. And then it will, iso uh, it will isolate the zone in the middle so that 
when we pump the fracturing fluid, it will not go below the bottom uh, tool or it will not go to the top of the tool, but it will only go to the perforation that we target to fracture, right? Um, well, um, basically, the idea is to minimize the number of trips as um, as less as possible, right? So if the uh, intervention, if different type of intervention can be done uh, in one go, we'll do it in one go. However, if it needs a spatial bottom hole assembly, then you need to pull out, change only the bottom hole assembly, and then move back again, right? Uh, however, as a reference, for example, in a 10,000 feet well, right? You probably need only about four hours to pull out the surface. Change BHA will take probably one hour, two hours, depending on the rig up uh, setup, right? And then you can go back in in the next four hours, right? As if in a different uh, type of intervention, for example, a hydraulic work over unit where you need to uh, pull out by breaking the pipe and then uh, join by joints, right? Or maybe two joints by two joints, and then you pull out and then you change the bottom hole assembly and then you run in again, join by joint, right? It will take a longer time, right? All right, next question. Go ahead, Oza. Hello, uh, thank you, sir. So uh, my name is Ramadan Ibn Asib. I'm from University of Malaysia, Kelantan. And uh, currently, uh, I'm doing my final year studies. My major is geoscience. So I have uh, several questions regarding the application. And maybe this is the general questions about, about the CTU. So first question is, um, for each round trip, how many bending cycles and bending events is the coil tubing exposed to? And the second one is, uh, which type of stripper assembly is recommended as a backup in high pressure application for CTU operation? And last one is, if, if the coil tubing and pumping high pressure will running at the same time, what will happen to the numbers of band cycles before the fatigues are occurred? Thank you, that's all for me. Okay, so I will answer that question, right? Mr. Yeah. Wait, uh, guys, when you ask a question, everybody only has maximum two. Okay, I forget to mention this. So, so we can have uh, anybody else uh, to get in as well. Okay, maximum two. One is best. Go ahead, Mr. Arifin. Okay, I will help him. I will answer the three questions in two answers, okay? So you can count it as a two question, right? So the first uh, one, I will um, answer what is the selection for the strippers, right? For the high pressure application, right? So uh, the stripper has, uh, um, for those who are not familiar, a stripper is basically a, a piece of equipment that has a rubber, so it will seal around the cold tubing pipe uh, to isolate the pressure inside the well bore through the lubricator with the environment outside of the cold tubing, right? Because outside of this uh, pressure control stack, it is uh, atmospheric uh, condition, right? So this is uh, the main function of the strippers, right? So the stripper has a couple of uh, requirements. First is the pressure ratings, right? When you are planning to do a high pressure operation, right? Definitely, you need to select the stripper that will have the rating of your application. For example, uh, when your uh, when your well has a maximum potential well high pressure, maximum potential well high pressure meaning the possible uh, pressure that you see at the well head, right? Let's say um, in extreme, we're talking about nine thousand psi, right? Then your stripper has to have a working pressure of 15,000 PSI, right? This will allow you to uh, control the well with adequate pressure uh, rating in all your pressure control equipment, right? When needed, when the contingency arise, right? So uh, answer number one is you need to select the stripper 
that has a, a, a appropriate working pressure, right? Second consideration for the stripper is the rubber insert itself, right? So uh, there are different types of the rubber insert, right? Uh, you have Python, you have Atlas, you have uh, uh, HBMR, right? Uh, how we select that one is based on the type of the fluid that the stripper will be exposed to and the type of uh, environment, whether it is a CO2, uh, what do you call high CO2 content or high H2S content, right? For example, HBNR, normally we can use it in non-sour well. Non-sour well means like a well without the H2S or CO2, right? But for wells with a high CO2 or H2S, right? You need to have something like Python or Aflas, right? Uh, that is more expensive, but that will allow you to seal around the cold tubing pipe without being affected by the high uh, H2S or CO2 environment, right? So now moving on to the next question about how we um, uh, maintain the uh, numbers of cycle without breaking the pipe because of the fatigue, right? That's a very good question, right? So in general, the when 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 this flexible pipe is being run in or pull out, right? It will uh, be exposed to a number of um, bending, right? So we can count, right? When the pipe is inside the well, right? It is in the straight uh, in the straight condition, right? But when it pass through the gooseneck, it will be bent, right? That's one cycle, right? And then when it pass through the gooseneck, it will again be straightened because it has to go from the gooseneck to the reel, right? So that's two cycles, right? And then inside the, when it is going through the reel, right? It will be bent again, right? So that's three cycles, right? So. Uh, when you are moving uh, in and out, right? In total, you're talking about uh, six to eight different cycles, right? Depending on how you move the cold tubing pipe, right? And how are we monitoring all those, right? Are we doing it like with a checklist or something? No, because we're not gonna have the bandwidth of doing that. But uh, uh, thankfully, right? We have a smart computer uh, to uh, to monitor this uh, movement, right? Nor uh, most of, all of Cold tubing company will have acquisition and recording software, and also the uh, acquisition uh, package that will allow to control how much is the number of uh, how many uh, cycle the cold tubing pipe has gone through, right? What is the pressure inside the cold tubing pipe? As you correctly pointed out, right? The higher the pressure inside the cold tubing, right? With the same number of uh, run, sorry with the higher the pressure, right? With the same condition of the pipe, the number of cycle will be less, right? Because uh, the fatigue will be much higher when the pressure is higher inside the cold tubing pipe, right? But we don't, we don't uh, manually count that one, right? We have a software to uh, monitor that one, right? And uh, normally uh, it will be presented visually as the number, uh, the increase of the life, or basically is the decrease of the life of the cold tubing pipe, right? If the, as a general rule of thumbs, right? If in one run, the cold tubing life is uh, decreased by 10%, right? Reduced by 10%, we need to pull out and then we need to do the pipe management to remove or to shift the weak point to another location, right? Does that answer your question? Okay, go ahead, next question. Okay. Last Thank question for... yeah, before we move to Padani. Okay. Thank you for the opportunity, Ms. Atma Sarifin. My name is Aki, graduated from Trisakti University, Batch. With, uh, 2015. 
Mas Arifin, uh, I, I have heard that CPU is capable of doing stimulation job, like fracturing or something like that. And when I was still doing my final assignment and witnessing job in Jambi, the fracturing job itself were using drill pipe instead of CPU, while CPU itself is presented right in the field for unloading the frac bit later. Is there any reason why the company didn't use CPU for the job, or is there any risk doing fracturing with CPU? Because if we was, if we if we use CPU right from the beginning, it, it would save quite a lot of money, right? And and time too, instead of dripping in joint by joint. Okay. Uh, yeah. And the, the second one, sorry, Mas, <laughs> I have two questions. Uh, yeah. If we do the job with CPU, and uh, let's say screen out is happening. Uh, is, is the procedure is the same as we using the pipe or not? Thank you, Mas Arifin. Okay, so I will uh, answer the first question, right? Yes, um, uh, you have the call tubing and then uh, there is ongoing frac operation. Why not um, uh, using the call tubing to do the frac? When I say that the call tubing can do the fracturing, of course, uh, it has to be designed properly, right? So. As I mentioned in the beginning, right, the cold tubing is uh, like a small rig, right, but uh, it also has a different configuration, right. Uh, in the previous slide, I talked about different configuration when it comes to mobilization, right. You have the skid unit, you have the trailer mounted unit, you have the, uh, what do you call it, the um, uh, portable unit and all that, right. But when it comes to the design of the operation, for example, for fracturing, right? Uh, we need to understand what is the job requirement. Normally for fracturing, you're talking about uh, high rate pumping operation, right? Uh, for example, uh, it's not uncommon in the US to pump 100 uh, barrels per minute, right? With a huge setup, right? But uh, different location will uh, have a different design. But for example, in uh, Australia, the pumping requirement is a uh, from uh, 15 to 20 barrel per minute, right? Definitely you cannot do that with a small coal tubing unit. And uh, if you remember in Indonesia, I said that the uh, most common uh, coal tubing pipe is between 1.5 to two inch coil. And uh, that small coal tubing unit, coal tubing pipe cannot be used to pump 20 barrels per minute, right? Uh, in Australia, when we do the coal tubing fracturing, right, we are using two and seven eight inch pipe, right. And as uh, we all know, right, the friction pressure will depend on the ID of the pipe and also the length of the pipe, right. So normally for coal tubing frac operation to allow a big rate that is required for the job, what we do, we increase the size of the pipe to two and seven eight, right. But also we cut the pipe as uh, uh, so what do you call it short as possible, right? If the well is only five thousand feet, right? We probably put about six thousand feet uh, cold tubing pipe only, right? So uh, yes, cold tubing uh, can be used for cold tubing frac, but it also needs to be adjusted to the job requirement, right? And uh, for the second uh, question, can you remind me what's your second question again? I'm sorry. Uh, if we do the job with CPU and screen out is happening, uh, is the procedure is the same as we use drill pipe or is there any any other procedure? Um, the basic technique of clean out will be the same, right? With the cold tubing unit has a biggest advantage because normally, when you are doing a fracturing operation, I assume that this is in the rig situation, right? Where the rig is already on standby, right? And then when you are screening out, you just need to run the drill pipe, right? Uh, but many situations when we do the frac completion, it is done by a rigless uh, condition, right? So having the cold tubing unit will allow you to do like a fast rig up, right? And immediately go down uh, to the top of this uh, screen out depth, right? Uh, the basic uh, clean out procedure is the same. It's basically to circulate the fluid, right? Where the fluid will carry the propane to surface, right? 
and uh, you go down slowly slowly until you clean the well completely if you use a certain type of propane for example a resin coated uh, sand where it may binds together and is quite difficult to remove by only the um, circulating the fluid right we can use like a special tool like a jetting tool to break this uh, resin coated propane right and then circulate it up the surface i hope that answered your question okay thank you mas arifin all right so i guess i'm going to hand over the slide to pak dani go ahead pak dani thank you mas arifin go ahead mas dani Okay, uh, thank you very much, Pak Arifin, Pak Yando. So, uh, uh, basically, I'm going to uh, just explain one, one of the slides about the application in Southeast Asia, right? So, uh, the way, I, I, I think this one is related with our company, right? The way we, uh, we segregate uh, our business is basically we become several geomarket. And uh, we call it Southeast Asia Geomarket. And uh, basically, it consists of uh, all of the country in Southeast Asia except Indonesia, and then we added India. The reason why we exclude Indonesia because Indonesia is quite big, and uh, basically uh, that's why it become uh, one more geo market, which is uh, we call it Far East Asia, the one that already explained by Parisin, right? So uh, in Southeast Asia. The most common cold tubing size is around 1.5 until 2 inch. Uh, basically, this is for the regular uh, operation, right? The one uh, that explained before, uh, which is uh, clean out, uh, cold tubing milling, uh, logging, and so on, right? And uh, we also performing several special application, which is we using one one quarter inch uh, pipe and also T238 pipe. Uh, most of this application is related with the cold tubing completion. Right? The 1.25 is uh, we have uh, several jobs. Uh, we put it the cold tubing as a cold tubing gas lift injection. So basically, uh, uh, the client is uh, they redo uh, performing a completion at the beginning, but they didn't install the gas lift system because uh, what they think is they don't need to do artificial lift. But once the formation become major and then uh, basically uh, the pressure is down, so they start to think that uh, to install a gas lift is uh, economical for them, right? So that's why one of the option, either re they redo the completion or this one we installing the cold tubing, basically they're using the existing completion and just change the wellhead and hang the cold tubing and we create the injection system with that gas lift. The 238, usually the one that I explained before for the velocity string, and also we install uh, uh, ESP pump, right? Uh, this ESP pump, uh, uh, sometimes also we inject the cable inside the cold tubing on this one. And then uh, uh, the environment over here is basically, if you say about Malaysia, Myanmar, Thailand, uh, Brunei is mostly so, is offshore operation, but some of it is there is a land like in Myanmar there is a land operation, and uh, in India is mostly is a land operation, also, and one of the I see about this is uh, geothermal. Uh, we also having uh, actually geothermal in Southeast Asia is not much only in Philippines and Indonesia and a lot is in uh, New Zealand, right? But uh, uh, geothermal is basically is a different animal. If you see, it's uh, different things rather than oil and gas. Uh, uh, and most of your mindset is need to be changed when you usually handling the oil and gas. When you go with geothermal is quite different because all of the completion is big. What they want is to, uh, to have steam, right? Steam production to the surface. The temperature is is very high, which is uh, usually oil and gas when you say high is uh, 350, 400 degrees. And this one is basically in the range 500, 600 degrees Fahrenheit. Okay. And then uh, the challenge itself for the Southeast Asia 
is uh, uh, most of the well is uh, they created, which is uh, highly they fitted to uh, to horizontal well, which is uh, is this one is quite significant in term of uh, operation, right? Because when you go with this high deviation well, uh, you limit yourself on the type of the intervention. And then from our side, that's why uh, cold chipping become economical over here. So we can do vari variety of job with the cold chipping. Like usually they use uh, the one that I explained before, uh, slick line, war line, which is using graffiti, right? But this one, uh, some of the job that they cannot do, we are doing it right now with this one. And then also we have several uh, subsea environment over here. And we have various type of platform, right? Uh, big, uh, in terms of size, in terms of the type, which is uh, uh, usually is limiting our, uh, the type of intervention itself. And the last one is the sub hydrostatic well. Sub hydrostatic well is mean is uh, the hydrostatic pressure is, uh, sorry, the reservoir pressure is uh, lower than the hydrostatic pressure. It mean, in term, let's say if you say you want to do clean out, what you do is you're doing a circulation like with the fluid to, to get the sand or the cuttings or whatever, right? Uh, just imagine if you don't, uh, if your hydrostatic is bigger, you cannot get any returns. So the challenge is basically uh, what we do is we, we make a design to by aerated by uh, putting a nitrogen so it will be a lighter fluid or we using other technique uh, on this one to encounter this uh, sub aerostatic well. The common application is basically uh, for sure clean out. That's probably uh, around 60% of our job. And right now, because uh, this one is already considered like a brownfield, right? So we go with this uh, uh, cold tubing cementing, a lot of jobs right now, cold tubing cementing, which is a lot of PNA. And then uh, uh, the cementing also, we do like an annual cementing for the uh, shallow zone, right? And then uh, we do also cold tubing perforation. Uh, and also the cold tubing fracturing, which is uh, performed in India. And I believe this one will be explained by Pa Arifin later on on the, on the technical. And then the highlight application is basically uh, some of the application that we done, which is a uh, water shut off, water and gas shut off. And also we go with this cat and roll operation, which is I will explain later on. And uh, some of the cold tubing completion and uh, multi-stage uh, fracturing. Stimulation and fracturing. Okay, uh, next slide. I think I'm going to pass to Pak John as for uh, Middle East. <clears throat> yeah, just for the uh, Middle East region, the uh, uh, the largest uh, activity for cold tubing is in the uh, Kingdom of Saudi Arabia. Uh, <clears throat> will be this year, the total uh, cold tubing unit probably going to hit uh, around 100 uh, units in the country. Common cold tubing sizes uh, from inch, th inch and three quarter to 278. Uh, one and a half inch coil is also exists, but uh, it's very few application with it. <clears throat> the challenges over in Saudi Arabia typically is a sour, uh, sweet and sour operation, H2S, uh, gas well, deeps, uh, and also extended reach up to 10 to 12,000 feet of uh, lateral, uh, and then this is not just a normal lateral. This is like uh, six and a quarter or uh, eight and a half inch open hole. So it's a it's a big, uh, <clears throat> big and long open hole. Uh, the common applications over there, the the basic one is the clean out, uh, stimulation for the oil wells or uh, milling or typically the gas well. Uh, some of the highlights of the applications, uh, there's a lot of uh, multilateral wells, um, <clears throat> either drilled with uh, rig or drilled with coil. 
uh, and also we will need on some of the um, extended reach well, we will need uh, uh, help from the tractor to convey the, the coil as deep as possible uh, to be able to do the stimulations or clean out. Uh, also some velocity strings applications as well. For Kuwait, uh, similar, uh, inch and a half to two inches, desert locations, high pressure, high temperature, uh, light carbonates, <clears throat> sour gas, typically, and uh, heavy oil. Common application, stimulation, clean out, milling and kickoff. Um, <clears throat> some selective stimulation with the horizontal ICD completion. In UAE, um, inch and a half to two inch, some of the, they, they also use few uh, 238 coil, uh, desert location, offshore and artificial island as well, similar to KSA. There, uh, the challenges over there is mega reach wells, 30,000 feet measure depth, with 4.5 to one uh, measure depth and TVD ratio, HPHT wells, uh, <clears throat> tight carbonates and open hole completions. Typical, co typical application, again, uh, very similar to around Middle East is the stimulation, logging, clean outs and kickoff. Qatar, uh, mostly offshore, inch and a half to two and three coil. Uh, <clears throat> there, uh, this one is a bit uh, unique with the deep wells with seven inch monobore completion, high rate gas well, extended reach. Uh, typical applications, acidizing, perforating, milling, and uh, inside seven inch monobore, which is uh, proven quite, uh, quite a challenging uh, application in, the, in Qatar. Next slide. Okay, uh, next slide. Um, I'm going to talk about the uh, application in, um, in uh, Europe and Africa, right? So in Norway, we're talking about two and three eight uh, inch coil as the uh, most common, right? Uh, the challenge that uh, as you would expect, right? That this is a um, uh, Scandinavian country. It has like a, a lot of strict operating regulation, right? Uh, talking about the use of the chemicals that uh, has to meet like uh, environmental uh, requirement and all that, right? Most common application is clean out and milling of scales, right? Uh, they also uh, do like um, high rate operation, right? Uh, in one point, they are using a big coil tubing unit to N78 to allow pumping operation up to 10 to 15 uh, barrels per minute, right? Uh, more uh, similar operation in continental Europe, right? But the challenge is that uh, it has a sub-hydrostatic well, right? Past geography for the transport because it has to uh, cross different countries, right? Different borders, right? And each time they cross the border, they need to uh, fulfill like a certain requirement, right? West Africa. Normally um, is uh, between one and a half to two inch coil, right? The environment is uh, deep water, offshore and land operation. Uh, the challenge is that um, geographical challenge, right? There are a lot of uh, location uh, where moving one uh, from one place to another is quite a challenge, right? The uh, highlight in this area is uh, there are a lot of deep water operation where it requires like a, a long uh, planning for the job, right? Um, planning offshore operation is not uncommon to start talking about the job design 12 months in advance, right? Because the criticality, right? Uh, I mean, in the peak of the uh, oil fill uh, period, right? Deep water can cause the operator from $500,000 per day to $1.5 million per day, right? So making sure the operation is done flawlessly is very critical, right? Uh, Nigeria and Ghana, right? The most common uh, culturing size is uh, 1.5 to 2 inch, right? With uh, 2 and 3.8 for special operation, right? 
Um, most of the uh, challenges again the porters right and uh, security also is a challenge uh, you guys probably read the news uh, from time to time that there are some security breaches uh, in places like nigeria right where they take hostage or they blow up pipelines right so really uh, working in this situation is not only on the technical uh, level, but also the security concern is a big thing, right? Um, one of the highlights in this operation is uh, to use um, open water well intervention, right? Open water well intervention, basically we run the cold tubing without any riser or any protectors, right? You just run the pipe until you go to the seabed, right? And then there is like a special equipment that will connect the end of the cold tubing to they said wellhead, right? And then you can start the operation, right? But just imagine, for example, if the well depth is about, uh, sorry, the, the ocean floor is uh, 500 meters uh, below the sea level, right? You need to run the cold tubing pipe to that depth, right? And you have to take into account the, 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 the wave and then the, the, the current uh, below the sea, right? So, you need to make sure that the pipe is not going sideways, right? Algeria and Tunisia, right? Uh, specific uh, problem here is that they have a um, location where they produce salt, right? When they produce salt, they, the salt is coming out to the well in a big chunks, right? It's talking about like a gold ball size, right? So it's uh, quite uh, challenging, right? What they do, they run like a spatial uh cold tubing pipe we call it like a velocity string or a dilution water string right install it inside the well and then uh, they continuously pump fresh water to dilute the salt formation right so by pumping like a fresh water they inhibit the salt formation so the well can produce longer uh, in russia the most common cold tubing size is 1.5 to 2 inches, right? Uh, majority of the operation are land operation with uh, some of the offshore uh, projects, right? The uh, challenges there is uh, uh, what do you call it? Uh, long horizontal section, right? Extended reach uh, well, uh, high pressure, right? And also the sanction, as you guys know, right? Uh, the U.S. and many European countries put the sanction not to allow uh, technology or product from the Western country to enter the Russia, right? So they do a lot of modification locally, right? And they're quite successful with it, right? And uh, Russia is one of the uh, biggest uh, oil uh, producer in the world, right? Uh, Saudi, Russia, and the U.S., they are uh, the big three oil producers, right? Highlight of the application, uh, pinpoint stimulation. We are going to talk about that uh, later on, right? Uh, gas shadow, right? And uh, se uh, several other things, right? Uh, they are the biggest uh, district in the world with regard to number of coal tubing units. In Russia alone, there are about 120 coal tubing units in the countries, right? Uh, Kazakhstan, the most common is 1.5 to 1.75. The most notable challenge here is the high pressure and high high stress, right? So, for example, in uh, in uh, Chepu, right, the high stress concentration is about 1% to 2%. You're talking about 10,000 to 20,000 ppm, right? In Kazakhstan, it can go up to let's say 25%, right? You're talking about 250,000 ppm high stress. Uh, concentration. So it is extremely, extremely uh, important to design the job and the, re uh, the equipment to use for the job, including the people competency and the safety gears uh, to make sure that people can perform the work in a safe environment and safe uh, process. For uh, the US land, right? Um, the main challenge for U.S. land is that tight formation. So almost everywhere else in the U.S., when they uh, need to be produced, they need to be fracked, right? 
So cold tubing operation follow the frac operation. Uh, in the past where we're talking about plug and perp completion, right? The majority of the uh, cold tubing operation is to mill the plugs, right? But uh, the um, entire philosophy of cold tubing operation in the US is to do things better and faster, right? So you're talking about two and three eight, two five eight inch coil tubing for milling operation. Uh, given the comparison, right, in uh, majority of the location, right, when you want to uh, plug, for example, 30 plugs, right, uh, we probably have to mill the first three plugs, do the wiper trip, uh, clean the well, right, and then you go to the next three uh, plugs, mill it again, and then completely clean the well, right. In the U.S., they just go with uh, the biggest cold tubing to allow, you know, like a high flow rate, and they mill the plug from the first one to the uh, the last one in one go, right? So in the U.S., it's very important to make sure that everything is done fast and efficiently and reliably. Okay. Mexico, the most common is 1.5 to 2 inch, right? Uh, the uh, operation is in land and in offshore, right? They have a very deep well up to 7,000 meters, right? Uh, again, the highlight of the operation is multi-stage fracturing operation. In Argentina, uh, mostly the same with the US. Uh, it's about uh, using the cold tubing as part of the fracturing completion, right? So we do a lot of cold tubing milling to complete the well after the fracturing operation. So now uh, we're going to talk about cold tubing drilling as a special technique. I will again hand over the presentation to Bang John. Go ahead, Bang John. Okay, thank you, uh, Arifin. All right, so Arifin already um, explained about the applications of um, cold tubing uh, from stimulation, fracturing, uh, running ESP. <clears throat> and completion uh, <clears throat> and also drilling. So I will talk about the cold tubing drilling. Uh, uh, is being used for drilling mainly. I would say about 95% is for uh, performing re-entry sidetrack uh, from existing wells, which this is the one I'm gonna talk most on this, on this section. Um, uh, next slide, uh, Arifin. Okay, so um, the advantages for uh, performing cold tubing drilling uh, in the existing wells, it is typically the operation is being done uh, without removing the Christmas tree. So the operation or the rig up is very similar to a cold tubing intervention, which is your rig up uh, on top of the Christmas tree with the BOPs and stripper and injector on top. So the operation, all the operation of this drilling is uh, through the Christmas tree, through the uh, production tubing, um, keep the existing completion in place. With the continuous pipe, as mentioned, uh, it is uh, very uh, faster uh, in the comparison to a drilling rig for the tripping time. No pipe handling, uh, because it's, it's not a, like a jointed pipe, it's continuous pipe. It's a uh, reduced HSC exposure for handling or uh, <clears throat> uh, pinching the fingers. The other um, advantages that being used uh, quite uh, widely is the build up ratio uh, up to 45 degree per hundred. This, this is a typical uh, build rate uh, that performed by culture bean drilling. Just as comparison for conventional drilling, the build rates uh, with conventional drilling is uh, an average or majority is a single digit, uh, typically three to four to six to eight degree per hundred. Uh, <clears throat> so with this, um, if you, if I can give you a, an example from the vertical well, if you wanna make a lateral or horizontal well, uh, 45 degree per hundred 
give you uh, you are you only need about 300 feet DVD uh, from vertical to horizontal, right? Compared to conventional rig, will will need a single digit uh, build rates. Will need about 2,000 uh, feet above DVD to be able to do the side track and landing in the horizontal section that you are targeting. Improve well control because everything stays in place. The Christmas tree stays in place. If you have three, triple SV stays in place. Now the other uh, significant advantage is continuous pumping, which means um, you can uh, control the ECD or the dynamic uh, annular friction much uh, tighter uh, when you performing or when we, we performing um, managed pressure drilling or underbearance drilling. So this will give a constant ECD all the time at the bottom hole condition. Uh, this is comparing to a uh, conventional rig where you need to stop pumping when you make up the connections and you pump again. So you give a uh, <clears throat> some pressure spikes in the, in the formation when you do the MPD or UBD. Uh, the um, recent or the, the last 15 or 18 years of the culture in the BHA, uh, we are already using uh, E-line inside the coil as the uh, telemetry method. I will explain this a bit later as well. So with this, we can um, pump pretty much um, as slow ECD as possible uh, with the culture being drilling. It means you can uh, practically pumping 100% uh, nitrogen as your drilling medium or drilling fluid, you would say, uh, to be able to create as low bottom hole pressures as possible to do the either MPD or underbalance drilling. Okay. And majority of the culture bean drilling package is uh, smaller in footprints because yes, it's, uh, the pipe is smaller than drill pipe. But also as you are um, drilling side tracks, the, the fluid packages, the tanks sizes and shakers, the active pit is you don't need as, as big as the uh, typical conventional rate. Next slide. But um, so culture wind drilling also has some challenges, okay? Somebody also already mentioned a fatigue. Yes, this is a fatigue limits the service and uh, this is gonna be uh, uh, adding into the total well cost or total uh, application cost to the, to the clients. Maximum reach is limited um, due to coil tubing lockup. This is depends on the trajectory uh, and also hole sizes. Again, the smaller the coil the, and the bigger the hole, the faster the coil tubing gets locked up. But uh, the bigger the coil against the, uh, the ID of the open hole, you can get um, better weight transfer, means you can drill further, but also the tighter clearance between coil tubing OD and the hole ID, it will increase your a uh, ECD as well, or your your uh, annular friction. So those are the ones that needs to be uh, uh, study when uh, when we uh, performing culture beam drilling. Hole cleaning in horizontal is more critical because culture beam, as you know, it cannot be rotated like a drill pipe. So uh, what we do for uh, to mitigate the hole cleaning issues is uh, Something that the drill pipe or the conventional cannot do is uh, wiper trip or tripping in and out, right? Uh, this can be done very easily with culture being drilling. <clears throat> hole stability is more critical because it's smaller hole size. Uh, true tubing operation, again, fishing options are gonna be limited because uh, all the fishing tools needs to be smaller than the whole ID, right? Uh, deepest current measure depth is about 20,000 feet. This is mostly limited because of the weight on width uh, can be applied to be able to drill uh, the hole and also uh, having the safety factor for the overpull 
when we get stuck. Coil is more fragile than drill pipe because um, <clears throat> it's uh, continuous. So if your one section of the coil is damaged, uh, for, for instance, uh, during the lifting uh, on locations or something fell on, on, the, on the reel, then you likely may have to change the whole uh, cold chewing string. Uh, <clears throat> also the weight of full reel uh, of large coil typically for uh, drilling is, um, is sometimes it's limiting factor for the crane capacity, uh, mainly offshore. But also for land operation, the weight or the size of this reel is also can be a limiting factor because of the road regulations on certain countries. Next slide, um, Arifin. Okay, now we're getting into more uh, technical into the how uh, we typically do the exit. So as mentioned, this is um, cold tubing drilling is being uh, widely used for re-entry wells, re-entry existing wells. Um, you can do uh, monobore deepening, you basically uh, whatever existing completions monobore, you can uh, mill the uh, flow shoe and drill open hole below it. Or uh, you can go through tubing and uh, deepening inside the casing. Uh, next one is you can place a uh, whip stock, a mechanical device to deflect the mill. You can mill the window uh, to create a hole inside the on the casing or the tubing, and then uh, do the side track, build section and lateral sections, and etc. Right. Um, also for um, the completion or the scenarios where you need to run through tubing and set inside the casing, it's also available. The, the whip is also available uh, to be able to sidetrack. In uh, dual completions like this, uh, typically three and a half inch, both three and a half inch inside 958. We've done some wells where we kick off uh, or sidetrack uh, from a short well, uh, short string and a long string uh, independently. Um, also can um, the other options or the other way of doing sidetracks is um, using cement as the way of kicking off the, uh, the well. Next slide. Okay. A little bit more details on casing exit. So again, as mentioned before, whip stock, you can set in tubing or set in casing. Uh, there's a one trip system as well as the two trip system. Uh, basically two trip system is the uh, uh, first trip is setting the whip stock. Second trip is milling the window. Uh, when we set the whip stock, one thing that needs to be considered is the, um, the direction that you want to exit the well. Uh, this is depends on the inclination of that particular uh, kickoff point as either you use a magnetic tool face or gravity tool face. Also, um, as we drilling a, a new uh, open hole or a new uh, side track, so the depth reference is basically in the existing wells terminated in the whip stock. So um, in the whip stock, what we normally do is putting a pip tag is a radioactive source in um, behind the whip stock. This is to uh, <clears throat> to be able to do the logging or tie in the 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 new well into the existing well. Um, when again on the uh, window milling, you can do a directional milling or non-directional. Uh, <clears throat> Different mill types, typically, or majority of cold tubing drilling, we normally use diamond speed mill. Uh, it's like the picture in the middle, in the bottom there. Uh, sometimes Tungsten carbide and, and watermelon mills to, to uh, polish the, uh, the window itself. Um, <clears throat> As you see on the previous slide, uh, dual casing exit, tubing and casing or tubing casing casing has been done before. Uh, different casing, casing materials, uh, typically L80 has been done. 
the P110, the harder uh, completion has been done, or even the 13 Chrome has been done with the, with the CTD as well. Uh, one thing that we need to consider as well is the rat hole when we perform the window milling. So we have a, a, a way when we coming back with the drilling BHA, um, <clears throat> the bit is not rotating uh, around the webstock because it's gonna damage the window itself. Okay. Next slide. Okay, now uh, we're talking about the telemetry. This is how basically the tool and surface or the directional drillers or the, the drillers at surface um, controlling or uh, getting the data from the tool itself when we do drilling. So in the, <clears throat> in the old days of culture bean drilling, uh, mud pulse telemetry is being used. This is the same way as the conventional drilling where the tool sending signals through the through the mud uh, inside the drill pipe to surface and at surface uh, there's a there's a receiver that decodes the signal and uh, giving the data to the dd or the driller right this is the uh, the old way of doing things in culture bean drilling but also right now is uh, <clears throat> uh, conventional rig still still widely use this type of the uh, telemetry now, I think in um, uh, around year 2002, uh, coal tubing drilling started using E-line telemetry. This is having the E-line inside the coil uh, for the data transmission from the tool to surface, but also sending command from surface to the tool to do what the DD or what the directional driller wants the tools to do or to go, yeah. So uh, this is the most common uh, bottom of assembly for culture bean drilling BHA today. Uh, another version of telemetry that being used or being developed in the past, I mean, this is just to share in the knowledge, is the capillary system. This is a very similar um, <clears throat> method, but inside the coil it's not just the wire lines that is exist inside the coil but also there's two umbilicals uh, basically two control lines inside the coil this is to <clears throat> to control the uh, orientation of the bent sub uh, of the motor in the bha okay uh, again if, if i mean you can you can tell with having two umbilicals inside the coil and E-line is getting a very uh, tight clearance inside the coil, then your friction when you pump is gonna go higher. When you have to have um, leave the BHA in the well and do the fishing it's becoming more complicated. So this system, uh, it's not being used uh, anymore. Next slide. Okay, so you're probably gonna ask the questions, how are you gonna steer the cold tubing drilling BHA, right? In the conventional rig, you normally, uh, you can rotate, uh, you can uh, rotate the drill pipe or you can uh, use the motor uh, on the drill pipe with the bed motor and you can rotate uh, from surface uh, through the rotary table, okay? Now call, with cold tubing drilling, you cannot rotate. The string does not rotate. What we are using to rotate um, the motor is in the drill culture in drilling BHA, you have to have uh, an orienter. <clears throat> it's either hydraulics or electrics. Um, you still, you have to have that one. So basically think about <clears throat> this one as your steering wheel in the car, right? So this one, is the one controlled by the DD uh, to go up, down, left, or right uh, with the steerable motor below it, <clears throat> okay? Uh, on the steerable motor, um, typically it's adjustable bend uh, from 0.6 to typical three degrees. This is basically telling you the bigger the bend of the motor, the bigger the build, uh, build angle uh, is. 
the smaller the uh, the bed motor, the smaller the the build radius. Okay. Next slide. On the bits, um, we almost never use a rock bit. Typical uh, rock bits like uh, uh, the big ones in uh, in the conventional rig. The most common bits we use the PDC bits. Uh, the one on the left is the PDC bits, a normal gauge PDC bits. So whatever the hole size that you want to make, uh, you uh, consequently you, you you select the the bit size uh, accordingly. Okay. Um, again, the because this is through tubing uh, operation where completion existing completion stays in place, the bit size is dictated by the minimum restrictions inside the well, either the nipple profile, the packer ID, or uh, ID of the completion itself. Okay. Now, um, as uh, I mentioned earlier about the higher ECD when you drill with coil or bigger coil uh, because of smaller hole size. Uh, it's also common in cold tubing drilling to use uh, what we call by center bits. Uh, the second, the, the picture is like the second bit on the, on the middle there. So <clears throat> what it does is it gives a, uh, a smaller pass through diameter when you do not rotate. Uh, this is to pass the restrictions of the nipple profile, the packers, and what whatnot. Uh, but when you drilling with these uh, by center bits, the center or the, the 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 pilot bit, the first half of the bit, will create a pilot hole, where the wing eventually gonna rotate and make a bigger hole behind it. So this way. Uh, we can drill slightly bigger hole size than the minimum restriction. Uh, again, this is to address the, uh, the ECD. The higher ECD gives you more problems on the differential sticking. Uh, higher ECD as well give you a higher bottom hole pressure. So you are uh, creating uh, excessive overbalance. So this one uh, will typically help uh, giving a less ECD during the drilling process with coil. Uh, next slide. Uh, okay, uh, now we, we touch base a bit on underbalance and minus pressure drilling overbalance. Uh, this is a, a basic knowledge uh, <clears throat> when we are planning the cold tubing drilling, we need to know the hydrostatic pressure of the weight, uh, uh, friction pressure as well, uh, type of fluid that we're going to use, and also the formation pressure, right? So uh, P1 or uh, formation pressure is something that we cannot uh, change. Uh, it is what it is. But uh, the P3 and P2 is the one that we can change, or we can we can customize to be able to drill safely with coil now with the uh, with continuous pipe like this, right? Uh, First, that we always think when we uh, doing drilling is the friction, right? Um, uh, you'll need a little bit of viscosity to be able to carry the cuttings to surface, but also the higher the viscosity, you're gonna gonna be a higher ECD and higher friction pressure. Uh, also, what you can play with is the hydrostatic pressure. Uh, this is you can play with either the the fluid weight itself. But also, you can reduce the fluid weight by uh, introducing nitrogen uh, or drilling with nitrogen. And then any excessive uh, pressure that you need, you can control with the choke as well. Right Now, uh, one thing that I, um, I haven't mentioned as well, having the E-line inside the coil for cold tubing drilling gives you a real-time bottom hole pressure when you're drilling. This is very important. Uh, when uh, we do MPD or underbalance, because we don't want to drill excessive underbalance, because the well the well can cave on you, and the well can uh, collapse as well if you do excessive underbalance. But also, <clears throat> this is to understand uh, how much overbalance, how much underbalance that you're applying real time while drilling. So this is something that is. Um, 
the conventional rig BHA do not have the real time capability of knowing what's going on down home. Okay, next slide. Um, this is giving you um, for high uh, high bottom hole pressures like the the typically what we what we've seen in Saudi Arabia, uh, drilling with the uh, seawater or or brine like uh, weight uh, fluids, we can achieve underbalance. Uh, so this is the simplest or easiest underbalance drilling uh, that can be done. Uh, <clears throat> And the next one, uh, next method of of uh, underbalance is if your uh, next slide, uh, Arifin. Okay. Uh, so on this method, where the bottom hole pressure or the reservoir pressure is not as high or or slightly under um, under pressure or, or subhydrostatic. Then we will still uh, we, we we need to introduce nitrogen to be able to reduce the hydrostatic and reduce the uh, frictions as well to be able to create uh, underbalance condition. Um, the next uh, method that can be done uh, next slide uh, Arifin is um, to use the existing completions to create the underbalance. So you can pump the gas or uh, nitrogen down the um, through down the tubing and casing analyst through the gas lift mandrels typically and uh, create underbalance or create or or lightening the um, the ECD in the analyst, which basically impacting your uh, total ECD while drilling. Okay. Uh, next slide. Now, as far as the um, uh, completion goes, the um, <clears throat> the formation will have to, will dictate what kind of completions that we can run. Okay, uh, for typical carbonates in Middle East, where the compressive strength is pretty pretty high, uh, they can lift uh, the well with the barefoot completion. This is the the simplest, cheapest. No, uh, and not complicated uh, for the drillers. Uh, also, the next one that can or have been run or is using the printed liner or slotted liner. It's not that expensive. Uh, this is typically if you have a medium strength formation that uh, the client still wants to have a support for um, for the. Uh, Formation so it doesn't collapse during the during the flow of the well. Um, you may need to also with the multi zones or having the gas, oil, and water zones. Uh, you will need uh, isolations in the analyst uh, for a sand control or wells that require sand control. We can run the screens or uh, convention method. The last one that we've We've been doing this in Alaska on a regular basis. It's running the solid liner, cemented in place with coil, and perforate with coil as well. Selective perforate with the coil. Okay. Next one. Uh, this is a various setup uh, of cold tubing drilling that uh, we've done before. Um, somebody asking questions about the um, number of cycles for fatigue uh, in the normal cold tubing uh, operations. Uh, you'll see the, the top left and the middle, uh, in the middle, bottom and middle. Uh, this is the setup we had in Alaska back in uh, early 2000 or late 90s, where the reel is located above the injector head. Okay. <clears throat> anyway, uh, next slide. I think we're running out of time. Okay, next one is uh, Danny can uh, take the presentation. Thank you. Uh, okay, yeah. Wait, maybe, uh, maybe there is a, uh, a guy here want to ask a question. Please raise your hand if you are. Okay, fine. Continue, Padani.
Go ahead, Pa. Continue. Presentation. Go ahead, Danny. Danny. I think it's uh, in uh, mute. Okay. Okay, so already unmute right now. Okay, uh, thank you guys. So uh, I see there is a question in the in the chat, right? So uh, the first one, what is the question for the cold gas lift? Let me answer that one. Uh, but Danny, I think you can just uh, continue with the catenary system. I will okay. ask question in uh, Zoom. Okay. 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 So I will do the presentation. So uh, thank you, everyone. So I'm going to explain about the pole tubing catenary system. So basically, uh, what is catenary system? So if you know, uh, uh, this one is applicable for the offshore operation. If you know, uh, I explained to you before, right, about uh, various type of platform, various type of uh, 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 equipment and so on, right? But uh, in terms of platform, uh, uh, most of the platform, actually some of the platform is not that big enough to be able to capture the cold tubing equipment. Because you know the cold tubing equipment is not just the cold tubing that uh, explained by pa Arifin, that's the basic of the cold tubing equipment. On the addition and additional stuff, you will have pumping equipment, uh, which is uh, hydraulic pump. You have uh, mixing equipment. You will have nitrogen equipment sometimes for the subhydrostatic well. So basically, a lot of uh, equipment you will going to bring. Uh, for some of you that uh, have performed going to the rig, uh, which is if you're looking at it. Uh, it will be almost the same, but, but, but the mini version for it. Right? So uh, uh, basically why we use the catenary system uh, is related with the platform area. If you see on the uh, right hand side, right? Can you imagine if you have platform like that, which is very small, usually they, they don't taking into account that you will have a big intervention over there, which is a uh, cold tubing is quite medium to big operation, right? So what they think is probably is you just going to go with the chemical because when I see over there is a, is a crane for lifting only pallets, right? And then uh, the next one is the platform crane capacity. So some of the platform is not uh, equipped with the, uh, big capacity of plat of uh, crane. So uh, if you looking at it, is uh, is only like around the uh, the chart that I put over there is only around five tons crane for the static and dynamic is three point four. How and the cold tubing itself, uh, the minimum cold tubing weight equipment is around. Uh, let's say the power pack and cabin is around. Seven, seven to 10 tons, which is, uh, you cannot lift the equipment over there. So uh, there is an option that sometime the customer uh, bring portable equipment. But again, if, if you have limited space, you cannot do that. So catenary is one of the option to tackle that one. I will explain later on. But uh, the next one will be the deck, deck loading, right? Uh, the deck loading is uh, 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 some, you need to spread the deck loading evenly. And uh, uh, the heaviest equipment usually in the cold tubing is the reel. The reel is uh, usually in, in between 10 tons. And if you go with this normal package in Malaysia, let's say it's around 17 ton to 25 ton of the crane depend on the size uh, of, of the cold tubing weight, depend on the size. Okay, so uh, you need to have that kind of uh, strength of the structure. Okay, uh, next part, So So uh, this is the typical of uh, basic of the catenary equipment. So by catenary equipment, basically you will be able to put uh, 
most of the stuff in the boat. And then you do all of the inter intervention from the boat. Okay. So uh, from on top of the normal coaching equipment, we need this uh, five equipment to support uh, the job. The first one is a catenary control cabin. So uh, basically this, uh, uh, you know that you already have the control cabin on the, on the, for operating the cold tubing, right? But you need to have this additional uh, cabin to operate uh, only the reel and the catenary head, okay? I will explain to you uh, again later on on the catenary head. But the reel over here, which is the heaviest equipment, you put it on the boat. So uh, later on, when you intervene the well, you don't need to lift it again to the platform. The catenary head, the function is basically, uh, you. Uh, this is for the contingency. So imagine if somehow uh, you have a high wave uh, or a, a bad weather, right? So, and then the boat unable to uh, maintain the position. So what you need to do is basically you need to pull out. And one of the function over here is basically to cut the cold tubing string in case this thing is happen instantly. So we can, uh, uh, the, the vessel or the boat basically can pull out from the platform so it will be safe uh, to the platform itself. Because imagine if uh, the very high wave, very high tide, and then uh, the vessel can basically obstruct the platform. And that will be one of the issues also, right? And uh, the next, uh, the reel also uh, will create uh, some tension. Basically, this is using the uh, uh, on the co uh, normal cold tubing. Is basically the reel is uh, creating the tension also. So on this one, we need to also to compensate the tension over here. And then the next one is the quick disconnect. The quick disconnect over here is the quick disconnect for the pumping, right? If you have, have ever seen the cold tubing equipment uh, before, uh, uh, sorry, cold tubing operation before, uh, uh, beside we line up the pumping line going to uh, our cold tubing, we also line up the pumping equipment to our stack, right? This is basically, uh, the function is basically, uh, one is uh, uh, to control the well, in case there is an emergency, you able to control, you can kill the well basically. And then the next one also, when you want to do a pressure test for all of your equipment. So uh, you need to rig up basically co-flexible hoses like a flexible hose to, uh, uh, to replace uh, the normal treating iron, normal pumping line. And then the next one will be the stabbing winch, okay? Stabbing winch is basically, the function is to step in the cold tubing into the injector head. So uh, sometimes when you go with the normal cold tubing, when you rig up on the platform, what you do is uh, if you, sometimes you're using a stabbing winch and sometimes you're just using a, a guide from the crane, right? And then perform it manually. But over here, you cannot do that because uh, uh, a lot of, uh, uh, beside the tension from the reel itself, you have the, the wave effect, right? So you need to be safe for personnel to be able to step in the cold tubing itself. This is during the regard phase, right? So that's why we need to have this tabbing winch on the catenary uh, operation. The next one is platform gooseneck. So this one is, uh, sometimes we use it, sometimes we not, right? Uh, the position is we put it on the platform. So uh, uh, basically we put it at the edge of the platform to prevent it's dragging uh, to the side of the platform. Okay, uh, next one. Uh, uh, this one is just a different picture. Uh, click, yes. 
So uh, this one is the real rig up of the catenary equipment that we perform in uh, that perform in Malaysia, right? So uh, can you click, Parisin? One. So this is the position of the catenary cabin. So we always try to position uh, the cabin and the reel is uh, uh, near to the platform side, right? Uh, the next one, Pak. Okay, so uh, uh, the one that I show you about the cradle, right? So uh, this cradle is basically is a connection. If you see the blue section over there, there is a cold tubing pump. So it will connect the pumping line uh, uh, to this cradle, and then it will have a quick disconnect. This quick disconnect is basically the function is to be able to disconnect the pumping line in case of emergencies. And then uh, after the disconnect, there will be a coflexic hose. If you see uh, a gray over there, uh, can you click it one more? Uh, one more? Yes, okay. So basically uh, I try to put it in a green. So basically is, there is a coflexic hose over there. So it needs to be in a U shape. So basically you still have a flexibility to uh, move uh, uh, forward and backward for the uh, for the vessel, and then coflexive hose. I will explain, and then you also have a coflexive hose hanger over there on the platform. Uh, the cold tubing string, if you see, is uh, going straight forward from the injector head, going to the uh, to the reel. Right. I hope you you can see it over there, and the winch is basically uh, uh, behind the injector head. Okay, but next. So uh, 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 talking about catenary, there is another stuff that, that we need to know, right? About uh, the boat itself. What kind, what kind of boat that we use for this catenary uh, jobs? The first one is the, we can use the anchor type work barge, right? So, uh, this one can be between four until eight. You have four, six, and eight anchor over there. So uh, uh, the good side over here is basically you know because you you anchoring uh, to the seabed, so the seabed, right? So uh, basically you have the stability while you can stop your engine. But uh, the downside of this uh, anchor type work barge is basically uh, prior the job, you need to survey, uh, do the uh, seabed survey, a uh, pipeline survey, right? Because you don't want to have your anchor is basically uh, damaging the pipeline later on when you do the job. And then the next one is a DP2 vessel crane. Uh, what is DP? DP is a dynamic positioning, right? So uh, uh, some of the boat have this kind of feature that uh, uh, even there is a wave, there is a tide, it can maintain the position without the need of anchor. For this one, uh, the difference between uh, DP2 and DP3, I, I also uh, put the picture over there, the CSS. This one is a compact semi-sub, it's a DP3 vessel. Basically, it's related about the redundancy. It's basically, it's almost the same. It can maintain the position, DP is to maintain the position, but uh, on DP3, they have uh, another contingency to maintain the position. On DP2, uh, what they have is basically, uh, if somehow there is a fire uh, on, the, on that system, uh, on the generator or something. On DP2, it will straight away fail. It will fail if there is a fire. On DP3, if there is a fire, it has another uh, uh, system that still able to maintain while you performing your contingency to 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 do the one that I said uh, cut the cold tubing and so on with, with the BOP right. So that's that's the difference. And DP one is basically there is no it can maintain the position but there is no uh, uh, fail safe uh, system. Okay, and then. Uh, I also put the picture. This one is the PNID of uh, uh, for the piping, the typical of the piping of the catenary jobs, right? 
So basically, most of the equipment, uh, the pumping equipment, uh, all of it will be in a boat, and then some of the heavy equipment will be on the on the boat, and some of the equipment uh, like the injector head, and uh, basically there is also jetting frame over there in the platform, and uh, there is some of well testing uh, equipment. Uh, to take the returns, right? Sometimes you cannot go straight away to the production line and then you need uh, testing facilities to have. And then uh, our preference is basically to put it on the platform. But if not, we also have the option to put it on the boat, but you need to have uh, three co-flex repos. Basically, one is uh, for you to, be, to rig up to your stack. One is uh, to get the returns from the from the stack itself. And then you uh, one is to inject back again to the production lines. Once you already uh, uh, process it to this uh, testing, equipment, well testing equipment. Okay, next Farifin. So uh, over here, I put the summaries uh, about the pros and cons, right? Between the full platform operation and the catenary operation. So basically the pro of the platform for sure, uh, it will be minimum impact on weather. Uh, you will have direct communication with basically all of the personnel and equipment will be on the platform itself, right? And uh, it will be independent operation. It means you don't need to have uh, support from others while the catenary, you need to have the support from the uh, vessel, uh, like from the captain of the vessel on the crew of the, of the vessel itself. And then uh, it relatively small size of crew comparing with the catenary because on the catenary you need to have additional personnel to operate the catenary equipment itself. And uh, uh, the cons will be uh, uh, you always need to have required large size of the platform, large size of the crane, and then so for sure sufficient uh, deck loading to cater all of the equipment. While on the catenary, basically this is one of the solution which is we can do faster rig up time. The reason why we go with this faster rig up time is uh, basically in operation, in location, right? So you already make a preparation itself on the base. When you spot your equipment and then perform sea fastening on the vessel, basically you do all of the rig up on the, on the base, uh, on the pier, I mean, okay? And then after that, uh, when you bring to the location, you're only going to rig up probably three or four equipment on the platform itself, which is uh, significantly reduce the time of the rig up. And then uh, 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 we can intervene the small platform size, uh, size small crane size uh, platform, and then uh, smaller deck loading, which is previously you cannot uh, do any work, which is uh, uh, probably only small operation. Uh, the cons will be, it will be de dependent on the weather, right? Because you will using a boat over here. So weather we, uh, tide will be uh, very crucial over here. And uh, need support from the vessel uh, personnel and then require a uh, big size of crews for sure, because uh, 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 you will have additional people for running the catenary equipment. And you need also to have proper communication planning because sometimes you also need to put personnel on the platform itself, right? To operate some of the equipment or performing some uh, checking or maintenance. So you need to have a proper communication planning here. Okay, Pak, next. So uh, basically on the catenary itself, uh, we classified some of the job, right? Uh, the first one is catenary boat pumping operation. So on the boat pumping is basically we just segregate between uh, uh, all of the pumping equipment, we put it on the boat, while the cold tubing equipment, we put it on the platform. This one is uh, doable if you have a, a, cray, a big size crane capacity on the platform, right? And uh, uh, sometimes also this one is you do it if you want to uh, increase the efficiency of the job. Basically we done uh, this one before in, in Indonesia actually last time in uh, 
Chevron. Chevron, what is the, the name right now? Chevron is in Balikpapan. Before uh, before the name is Chevron, I think it's already put Now it's the Pertamina Hulu Kutai Timur. PHK. Pertamina Hulu Kutai Timur. Okay. Yes. Yeah. So uh, basically, because uh, they have a campaign, right? Several campaign on the different platform. So what we do is basically, for sure, we cannot just at the uh, beginning we put it all of the equipment in the platform, but. Uh, the efficiency of the job probably in one month we can only do two two wells, two wells, three wells. The issue is because uh, we need to rig up and rig down the equipment all the time, and sometimes even uh, from shifting from one well to one well, we need also to put it on the boat first and then rig up again because of the space, right? So at that time we put it. All of the pumping, yeah, we just put all of the pumping equipment on the boat and then we bring for flexi poles. And with that one, we basically increase the efficiencies of the job to become around 60, uh, reduced to only 60 on, on 60 to 70 percent from the original one. So uh, that's one of the options. The next one is, uh, can you click it again? Catenary uh, without hydraulic disconnect. So basically, it's a partially catenary. So what I said, without hydraulic disconnect, is uh, uh, we put the reel beside the pumping equipment. We put the biggest equipment on the boat, which is the reel. This one is basically when we still have uh, sufficient, uh, like medium size of the platform, and but you don't have a big size of crane. So we use we put the reel over here. Uh, uh, of uh, the reel on the boat. So uh, while we keep pupi, uh, putting the injector head, uh, the control cabin, and the power pack on the platform. The reason why we do like this is basically uh, we want to have a, a control right on the injector head. Because uh, when you put it uh, on the next classification, uh, basically, if you put the hydraulic uh, capability on the boat, uh, if sometimes there is a weather pickup, what you do is uh, you need to uh, uh, disconnect this hydraulic system. So you cannot operate the injector head uh, again. So uh, uh, this one will be creating some of the downtime, but uh, uh, basically the decision is basically is related with the platform type itself and also the weather condition, because you can estimate, right? This one is the monsoon system, uh, or this one is a, a, a normal system, right? Okay, the next one is basically, this one is the full catenary with the hydraulic disconnect. So everything beside the injector head will be, we put it on the boat. So uh, the one that I tell you that uh, uh, basically 90% of the person will be on the boat and probably only we left one on two guys just to do a monitoring on the injector head on the platform itself. Okay, next one. So uh, this one is basically a, a comparison, right? Uh, between each uh, uh, each type of the catenary. The first one uh, is uh, the weather impact. So basically if you go with the platform, full platform operation, it will be very minimum. With the boat, uh, uh, boat pumping operation, it will be affected, but not that high. Basically, we, uh, uh, we're still able to operate uh, the cold tubing itself uh, during that time. And then uh, the catenary without uh, hydraulic disconnect and uh, with the hydraulic disconnect, it will be affected. But uh, if we go with this uh, without hydraulic disconnect, we don't need to cut the cold tubing. Uh, what we can do is we just able to disconnect the uh, pumping line, and we can just pull off the coal tubing, and then uh, basically uh, the boat will just pull out from the platform. And then once we want to resume again the operation when the weather is already calm, they can just go and then connect again the line 
without the need to uh, do again the recap, which is step in and so on, right? So that's one of the benefit. Preparation time is basically, uh, this one is related preparation time in the, uh, in the base or in the, uh, in the peer itself, right? Which is we do uh, on the full platform will be very minimum, but uh, the other uh, part is uh, we need to do C fasten uh, for uh, the equipment itself. Which is on the boat pumping, it will be only the pumping equipment, while the uh, the other is you add with some of the coaching equipment itself. Rig up time, uh, the one that I tell you that before that uh, uh, catenary can improve uh, the efficiency by efficiency by uh, reducing the rig up time. And then uh, disconnecting procedure, the one that I explained before, right? Uh, uh, while you disconnect with the full hydraulic, uh, uh, with the full catenary system, you need to disconnect everything and then you need to cut the cold tubing if uh, uh, having a bad weather. While uh, if you do with the, uh, without hydraulic disconnect, which is, this is the one that uh, hydraulic disconnect between the power pack to the injector head, the one that I, I mean, right? So on this one is uh, basically you don't need, you don't need to cut the cold tubing. And for sure, the uh, platform size and the crane size, uh, which I explained for. So basically, the selection criteria is basically if you have a big size campaign or uh, uh, big size of campaign, there is potential you uh, this catenary can be beneficial for you, or you have a very a lot of uh, small size of platform. And then the next one is also the weather forecast. Okay. Uh, uh, the lesson learned over here, usually we are not going to intervene the job during a bad weather condition, uh, which is monsoon season, right? So during the good time, we can uh, plan this catenary to improve the efficiencies. And then uh, uh, later on, once you have the uh, monsoon season, you can plan for the uh, uh, platform size of operation. So in that one, you will have a full uh, efficient for the full year. Okay, uh, I think that's all. Uh, yes, I think that's all. Uh, if you, is there any question for this one? Okay, Mas Arifin, is there any uh, any more uh, presentation after this, Mas? This is gonna be the last one. I'll make it quick. Okay, please do. You have about ten minutes, Mike. Thank you. Yeah. Sure. So uh, thank you, um, Mas Yendo. So as uh, we mentioned earlier, cold tubing can be used as part of the fracturing uh, completion, right? Uh, normally, the multi-stage completion are done uh, with the technique as shown in the slide, right? <coughs> you have the un <coughs> excuse me. You have the uncemented open holes, right? So basically, you uh, divide the zone to be frac uh, with using um, open hole uh, packer as shown on the left uh, pictures, right? Or uh, there is another alternative, what we call a cementing plug and perp, right? Basically, we perforate the first zone, we frack it, right? And then after that, we set the uh, breeze plug in between, and then we perforate the zone above, and then we frack it, and then we set the plug above and on and on and on until all the zones are uh, frack and perforated, right? Uh, the next one is um, you have a different uh, type using like a um, small uh, smarter uh, completion, right? To enable you to frack the well um, in a different intervals, right? So all these techniques are very good, right? Uh, however, it has uh, its own uh, merit and it, its own drawbacks, right? So one of the things that is being developed and it has been widely uh, uh, accepted in North America and uh, several other locations, uh, for example, in Russia or in India, right, or in Argentina, is what we call a pinpoint um, selective uh, stimulation, right? How it works, right? I have a video, but uh, it will take uh, a little bit of time to explain it. I will try to explain it in a, in a quick way, right? So basically what will happen is that uh, we'll have like, um, for example, you have a well uh, that has about 20 zones to be fracked, right? So rather than to perforate 
each of these uh, zones, right? What uh, we can do is that we run as part of the casing a sleeve that can be open or closed, right? When we run the casing, right? So the sleeve is going to be run and placed exactly at the zones where we will frag, right? So putting the sleeve there uh, will save us from doing the preparation, right? Because uh, when it is run, it is in a closed position, but then you can open it uh, as if that you are making a preparation, right? So that's uh, one way of doing that, right? But now, if you want to frack it, right? You need uh, to be able to open the sleeve, right? So uh, th this is where the cold tubing uh, comes to the equation, right? So what will happen is that uh, in the beginning, you run the well with the slip, and then uh, you put all the 20 slip in the closed position, right? And then after that, you run with a coil tubing, right? And then uh, with a certain BHA, I will talk about the BHA uh, later on, right? Uh, you open the slip, right? And then after that, when the slip is open, you place the BHA below the slip, and then you frack the well. So when you frack the well, you frack the well from the surface with the coil tubing inside. But the fracture is done in the area or in the flow path between the coil tubing and in the well bore. Doing that will allow us to pump at a higher rate compared to pump the fracture infringement through the coil tubing, right? So that will eliminate the requirement to have a big coil tubing, right? You can do this with the small coil tubing, right? So once the first zone has been fracked, right? This one, right? This one has been fracked. Or let's say this one has been fracked, right? The slip is open, right? What we do next is that we open the slip on the top, right? We open this one, right? With the slip below are all in the open position, right? And then after that, we put the cold tubing BHA in between the newly opened slip with the previously open slip, and then we set the packer to isolate the previous zones, right? So by doing that, when we are fracking to the surface, right? We are going to frack through this um, uh, uh, upper zones, right? And then isolate the previous zone from being uh, exposed to the fracturing pressure and the fracturing flow rates, right? And then after you finish fracturing the upper sleeve, right? We move the coil tubing to the next one, isolate, opening up the next sleeve, right? And then uh, isolating the that sleeve with the previous one, and then on and on and on, right? So by doing that, we can uh, quickly fracture many states in the wellbore in one single coil tubing trip, right? Uh, in comparison, for example, if we go with the uh, plug and perp, right, what we do, we perforate the first well either with the coil tubing or with the wire lines, right, and then after that, we pull out the surface, and then we set the plug again, right, and then after that, we pull out the surface, right, and then we, 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 frag, uh, so we perforate the next one, and then we frack it, and then we pull out the surface, and then we set the plug, right, so this step will take more time, longer time, and not to mention that after all the fracturing operation has been completed, uh, the well will have 20 or maybe 19 plugs inside the wells, right? And these plugs must be uh, drilled or milled with a coil tubing to allow the well to uh, produce from all the zones, right? But with this uh, technique, right, um, all the well can be fracked with a coil tubing inside the well, right? And then the fracturing operation can be done from one zone to the others, right? So this will allow the equipment to frack the well uh, is less compared to if you need to frack all 20 states in one go, right? So this will allow the uh, equipment reduction with this technique, right? So the key component of this uh, technique is that you need to have like a spatial slip, right? that will be installed as part of the well completion, right? The slip can be open or closed, right? And then uh, as part of the coil tubing uh, bottom hole assembly, you need to have like a shifting tool that will allow to 
open and close this uh, what do you call it this slip right open it before the fracturing operation and then uh, the next one you need to have like a multi-set packer that will allow us to isolate the zone that previously has been fracked from the current zone that we want to frack right so this is just basically like a configuration of the bottom hole assembly that is part of the coil tubing right this is how uh, uh, it worked right uh, on the uh, on the um, well execution right the slip is um, being operated by the shifting tools right and then the uh, packer will be used to isolate the zone that has been previously fracked. So there are many ways uh, of doing that. You can uh, frack it and then leave the next one open, isolate, and then frack the next one. Or you can basically open the uh, slip, frack it, and then close it before moving on to the next one, right? But uh, normally the fastest way that is being used in the North America is to frack it, leave it open, and move to the next one. Uh, just for information, in one well, they can frack the well. In one cold tubing run, they can frack the well up to 79 stages. That is impressive. In one cold tubing run. So you don't need even to uh, pull out the surface to change the bottom hole assembly. It can all be done in one go. All right, so that's um, the end of the presentation. If there are any questions about the cold tubing drilling, about the catenary or the pinpoint stimulation, feel free to ask. Okay, uh, everybody, uh, if you have any question, raise your hand. Uh, because a lot of a question now is asked from the chatting uh, Zoom chat and then YouTube chat as well, Masarifin. Maybe you can pick one of our questions from the chat. Um, yeah. Let me select. Um, uh, let me open it. Okay, so there is a question from Aldo, Leonardo, right? Uh, he wants to ask question about how is the mechanism of cutting coal tubing because uh, of any reason. Is it any activity that we have to do before cutting the coal tubing? Right, so cutting coal tubing can be performed for many reasons, right? Uh, normally when you prepare the coal tubing for bottom hole uh, connection, you cut the coal tubing uh, to make sure that the connector between the pipe to the bottom hole assembly can withstand the pressure test and the pull test, right? Um, cold tubing cutting operation uh, can also be performed to shift the fatigue, right? From one place to another. Just imagine uh, a situation like this. If we need to do like a lot of run at a certain depth, let's say 5,000 uh, feet, right? So all the cycle, will accumulate at 5,000 feet, right? Let's say we're talking about fishing operation with multiple attempts, right? So there's gonna be like a lot of cycling and bending at 5,000 feet, right? If we continue doing that, right? Uh, out of, let's say 10,000 feet of coal tubing, the fatigue will be concentrated at only 5,000, right? So the remaining of the coal tubing pipe will still be okay, but at 5,000 feet, the, that section has been cycled and bent multiple times that uh, the fatigue is accumulated, right? So one of the technique uh, to maintain the integrity of the pipe is to cut the pipe. For example, we cut it 500 feet, right? So once uh, we cut the coal to being 500 feet, now when we go back to 5,000 feet, right? The bending and cycle cycling will not be happening on the same spot as it was before. It will be shifted uh, about 500 feet, right? So that is uh, a technique to distribute the fatigue, not to accumulate in only one point, right? I hope that answers your question, right? Um, let me pick up another question. Is it possible 
what is possible failure that can occur in pole tubing operation? Thank you. This is the question from Ivory Hanif Hermawan, right, from uh, University of Pertamina. So yeah, uh, as uh, we explained to you, right, uh, the cold tubing pipe is normally smaller and more fragile than the drilling uh, pipe, right, from the drill pipe or, you know, like a big size tubing, right? Uh, because the cold tubing uh, pipe needs to be uh, flexible to be wrapped around the rails, right? However, uh, being flexible, it means that it is uh, more fragile than a normal pipe. So a uh, possible uh, problem with the cold tubing pipe is um, pinhole, meaning like a small hole in the pipe, right? And then uh, you, uh, the cold tubing uh, pipe can also be twisted, right? Uh, for let's say drilling operation, if the torque is higher than the torsional yield of the pipe, right? Or the pipe can be uh, collapsed, right? Let's say the pressure in the well bore is too high for the cold tubing pipe to withstand, then it may collapse, right? Uh, understanding that there are risks that will happen to the uh, pipe, then what we do is that in the software we have, uh, every cold tubing company will have a software that maintain and monitor the safe working limit of the cold tubing pipe. In SlamBG, we call it coil limit, right? In the different uh, cold tubing provider, they will call it uh, different uh, names, right? But basically this uh, safe uh, working limit is taking into account 80% of the maximum limit of a uh, cold tubing pipe operating before it has the chance of uh, you know uh, getting damaged, right? So you take 80% uh, of that with a 20% uh, safe margins, right? And even that, within that 80%, we try to stay away from the 80% limits, right? So by adjusting the operating parameters to be within a safe working limit, uh, we can avoid having the cold tubing pipe uh, being damaged, right? So I guess um, perhaps Danny or Bang John can pick up some other question to answer, or if there is any uh, question as well from the audience. Uh, Mas John, I think that he has a conference call like five minutes ago. Okay. All right, so uh, last, uh, last over here, uh, peoples. If you have any question, raise your hand and I'll let you in on call to being. Okay, while waiting, uh, again, don't forget to uh, to uh, write your absence, attendance in Telegram, our Telegram uh, Yadmi course, okay? Follow our uh, YouTube, Yadmi training YouTube, follow our Instagram, Yadmi Pusat, and follow our uh, Telegram, which is Big Yatmi and Yatmi course as well. Okay, so I think with this, we conclude the presentation. Mas uh, Arifin, please have a closing uh, remark and as well, uh, Mas John, Mas Arif, uh, Mas Dani and Badia as well. Go ahead, uh, Mas Arifin. So thank you, Mas Yando. But before we uh, make the closing remark, I mean, uh, we have um, a quiz, right? For oh, yeah. Audience. True. Go ahead. OK. So um, I have a Oh, question. wait, Mas Arifin. Yeah. Mas Arifin. Yeah, go there ahead. Is a, there is a question here. Uh, somebody raised hand. Where is it? Yeah, go ahead. Go ahead. Uh, sorry, Mas Arifin, I want to ask another question. Yes, sure. uh, reg Sorry. regarding the special city application so this sleeve act like uh, as an open openable bridge plug so i mean like uh, do we have to still have an pressure test before before fracturing each stage or or not and the second question is question. i know have question thank only you only one question okay Mr. Okay, so I guess you are referring to the pinpoint stimulation that I just presented yeah. uh, on the last uh, uh, part, right? So yeah, normally uh, the uh, packer will be pressure tested at the blank uh, casing to check the integrity of the packers, right? Uh, different, different customers, right? Uh, 
may ask for multiple um, pressure test after uh, certain stage, let's say after uh, 10 or 20 stages, right? But um, in many uh, operators or oil company or gas operator in the US, right, where they do this um, uh, frequently, right? And they already know that the system is very reliable. Uh, they do not uh, want to do the pressure test because Mas Yando, uh, may and Bang John may also confirm, right? In the US, it's all about doing it faster, right? If you can eliminate uh, five minutes of unwanted uh, step in the operation, they will do that, right? For example, in, the, in, in Indonesia, right? When we're talking about the NPT, we count the NPT, let's say uh, daily NPT, let's say one day downtime is equivalent to 15,000, right? In the US, normally they calculate the NPT not in days, but in minutes, right? So that's uh, to show you how uh, the operation in the US, it needs to be reliable, it needs to be fast, right? I hope that answers your question. Thank you, Mas. Okay, next question. Okay, good evening, uh, Mr. Arifin and other CTU expert. Uh, my name is Timothy Lian Putra Indrianto from Pertamina University. Uh, so the question is, could we replace a conventional cementing operation with the CTU cementing operation and why? Thank you. Thank you. All right, so uh, Danny or Bang John, do you want to take or uh, should I take this one? Okay, I will, I will answer just to, uh, what do you call it, uh, make it fast, right? So it depends on, uh, <clears throat> on the, um, uh, what you call it is the primary cementing, right? Uh, right now, uh, normally the uh, main application for cold tubing cementing is on the remedial side, right? You're talking about um, uh, squeeze the cement uh, in the interval where the cement uh, bond is very bad, right? or to do like a cement plug, right? Or to put like a kickoff plug, right? But then again, uh, there was, um, I think a uh, long time ago, there was an attempt to do like uh, uh, primary cementing jobs with the coal tubing, right? But after being evaluated, I don't think it is uh, something that uh, can compete with the normal um, cementing operation, right? So uh, to answer your question, no. Uh, at this point, the current cold tubing cementing application is normally revolved around remedial cementing operation. However, I wouldn't be surprised when the requirement um, exists with frequent requests, right? And with the advancement of the technology, this uh, technique can be uh, evolved and can be a standard practice, similar to cold tubing drilling, right? About uh, 30 years ago, no one thinks about the uh, coil tubing drilling operation, but then uh, when there is like a requirement to drill a small or pilot hole, right, and without the uh, need of the rig, right, then the technique of coil tubing drilling is um, uh, created and it becomes like a standard practice that it is very reliable, right? Okay, so let me check if there is other question. All right, fine. Go ahead, Mas Arifin, uh, closing remark, please. Oh, quiz first, yes. Okay, Pak Dani or Bang John, maybe you can ask the question. Uh, sorry, how, sorry. Do we, how, how do we do this quiz? Uh, you will pick up the, the winner, yeah? Yeah, I mean, uh, the guy who raised the, uh, the the answer will, and if it is correct, then uh, he will get the... Uh, the price, right? And then uh, it will be sent after we get the address. All right, fine. So we will go, uh, you ask a question and then we will see from the raise hand and then we uh, will let them enter. Okay, one by one, whoever comes first. Go ahead. Go ahead, Padani. Okay, uh, probably just a simple, uh, the simple one. Uh, yes. What is the function of the power pack? 
What is the function of power pack? Okay, so uh, Marcelinus Gonzaga, go ahead. Well, power pack is works to store an electricity or kind of energy for the coil tubing itself, uh, the entire operation of the coil tubing unit. On, only electricity or uh, can you elaborate more? Well, every operation, of course. So like the entire CTU, yes. Hmm. I see. I think it's only partially correct, right? I mean, uh, there is usually uh, Arif, Arifin already explained before, right? Related with the the one that because the name is power pack to have the power, right? And, and yes. how they they uh, control the power by using what? Danny, the there is another room. another one, Ivory. The okay. control. Oh, the, the power. Pack. What is it? Ivory, go ahead. What's your answer? Uh, okay, but, uh, a power pack unit is a uh, provide hydraulic power to control and operate a coil tubing unit and pressure control equipment. Thank you, but. Ah, yes, it's a good answer, Ivory. Good. Okay, Ivory get a prize. Ivory Hanif Hermawan. Thank you, but. All right. Contact me after this, okay? Okay, but All right, next question. Uh, doesn't have to be technical. It, it can be any question, right? But yes. And uh, right, okay. I will yeah. ask a question. It's a social question. Uh, it doesn't have anything to do with the um, pole tubing, right? Just to make it fun, right? So, can anyone tell me the the famous uh, TV series that is adapted from the English series Doctor Foster? It's from Korea. There you go. Come on. Nobody raised a uh, hand. <laughs> they watch Hollywood, man. Uh, they watch, nah, come on. Uh, young generation, they watch everything. All right, fine. Anybody? Okay, next question. <laughs> okay. Thank you. Hmm? You have a question to ask? Yeah, I do. So, <clears throat> um, remember what when uh, Arifin mentioned about, or somebody asking about how many cycles uh, for culture being fatigue. Now in the, in the case of the injector, uh, the reel is above the injector head. So how many cycles is that for uh, fatigue modeling? That's not easy. <laughs> All right, anybody raise hand. Okay, we still have uh, how many guys here? We still have 260 now. All right, so another question. Danny? Okay, <clears throat> I have another question. For Go ahead. When, we, when we mill or when we drill with the motor, with the pole tubing, right? Uh, where is the direction of the bit turning and where is the direction of the reactive torque turning or uh, the, where is the where is the direction direction of the reactive torque it's probably a bit too hard then that's Nobody. pretty hard, maybe. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay. I guess we can also select the uh, best uh, question that was asked earlier, right? Yes. From go YouTube, ahead. From Zoom, right? So uh, one from Zoom and then one from YouTube. Dia. Yeah. yeah. No. I mean, we can select later. Yeah. I mean, there okay. have many questions, so we already have one winner, and then the other two prize we can give to the best uh, question in Zoom and one uh, in YouTube. Yeah. Okay, so you guys let me know, okay? Later. Okay. Yeah, we will. We will. All right. Bang thank you so. You thank you so much. Remark, okay. Say it again. Maybe Bang John can make the final remark statement. Go ahead. Everybody make a remark, please. Bang John, <coughs> uh, Mas Arifin, and Mas Dani, and Badia. Go ahead. 
Uh, let me start. Uh, this is John. Uh, thank you for attending this um, <clears throat> Uh, learning about culture, fundamental culture being uh, learning session. Uh, it's, it's a lot of questions and uh, I like the uh, enthusiasm of the participants and hopefully um, you guys understand a bit more on the intervention with COIL and, uh, and uh, apply it uh, either when you are graduated and, and working for uh, either service company or the uh, oil company or or any any anything in between. Yeah, thank you. So uh, I'll uh, follow suit, Bang John. So again, uh, same feedback as uh, Bang John mentioned, right? A lot of enthusiasm, right? And I compare uh, the uh, student nows with the uh, uh, the period where I graduate is uh, far better right uh, i mean you guys uh, speak english very well and then you uh, get to know things that is not uh, only taught in the uh, universities right uh, you seek um, uh, you know um, different uh, ways to learn right um, beyond your uh, you know like uh, um, normal uh, procedure right so uh, I, I, I'm really glad that uh, we see like uh, better, um, what do you call it, uh, graduates from university because uh, we as a country need to have a better graduate to improve our nations, right? So I really hope that um, uh, as the generation move forward, uh, we are get, uh, getting better, right? And again, thank you for the uh, attention during the presentation. Uh, in case you have any more questions, our contact details are uh, in the um, our CV, right? Feel free to ask. Okay, thank you. Hey, Pak okay. go ahead. Okay, uh, I just want to thank you all, to everybody, to all of the student, right? Like Arifin said, uh, the quality of the student right now is very, very uh, much better than on our time, right? And uh, I see very active participation. And uh, I also see the, what is it? You have, you have the knowledge, basic knowledge when you're asking the question. So it means you read some stuff, right? It's not completely zero, you come to this uh, training. So uh, it's really, really good. I mean, uh, uh, very enthusiastic and then, I also know that uh, with the current condition with the COVID-19 and then you see a lot of uh, downturn in the oil and gas, but uh, I'm, I'm just going to tell you that uh, no need to worry, right? Because uh, the issues right now is the issue of global. So when you have a downturn, for sure, you, you have a upside later on, right? So uh, I believe uh, uh, oil and gas will go, will pick up uh, in the near time, so don't need to don't need to be worried, right? Uh, most of you are still student, right? But uh, uh, I hope you you still have a, a high high hopes right now. That's all. Thank you, thank you. All right, it's almost two hours. We started at uh, what two p.m. and then we are now at five. So uh, again, thank you very, very much on behalf of IATMI. Uh, I thank you all the presenter, Mas Arifin, Mas John, and Mas Dani, and as well Mbak Dia for uh, answering all the questions in YouTube as well. So everybody, thank you all these attendants today. We have, uh, let, me, let me check my record here. We have 600 attendants today. And this video, remember this video is recorded in YouTube, IATMI training, please subscribe. And as well, follow our Instagram, Yatmi Pusat. Okay, so everybody, uh, all the students and lecturers, please join as well our Telegram, Big Yatmi. Uh, search the name Big Yatmi and you'll find us there. So uh, thank you very, very much for everybody. Have a blessed Ramadan. And, you know, it is uh, in front of us another three days. So I'm on my applied and batin. Thank you and see you again on next today. Uh, on Thursday, we have a presentation communication skills like CEO by uh, Mr. Supratop. So uh, thank you very much. Uh, see you again soon. Bye-bye.
Thank you, Mas. Thank you, everybody. Bye. Bye-bye.